Mirror check. You've got your beige parka on, your chisel is packed, and your overnight plane ride to Saudi Arabia is booked. You know what this means, right? Unfortunately, you weren't cast in the remake of Dune. It just means that you're ready to go explore the world's largest desert areas in the hopes of uncovering prehistoric secrets about our ancestors. Let's get one thing straight. If you ever thought that deserts were empty spaces, think again. They might be filled with sand as far as the eye can see, but they also hold a lot of history, you know? Because before humans settled down in cities and towns, we were nomadic people, and we traveled all around the globe looking for food, water, and shelter. So we had to come up with some interesting stuff to survive. Like this thing that was found in the desert of Saudi Arabia. Do you have any idea what this could have been? Over many years, scientists have discussed the origins and use of huge structures such as these ones. It seems our Neolithic ancestors were way smarter than we gave them credit for. They didn't spend all their hours around the fire carving weapons out of stone. No, they were also practicing their architectural skills. These huge stone structures are called desert kites. Because if you look at them from a distance, well, they sort of look like kites. Archaeologists have arrived at the consensus that these kites were used to lure animals in. This way, it would make it easier for our ancestors to guarantee their week's food. But that's not all. Take a look at these monolithic structures right here. They show us that our ancestors probably drew on rocks, the blueprint of what they were going to build on the ground. Just like modern-day architects, desert kites could be miles long, so they drew out a plan before actually building them. The most surprising feature of all is that these kites were built even before things such as Stonehenge. We're talking around 7,000 to 9,000 years ago. Over the last decade, scientists have been able to identify over 6,000 desert kites spread across the Middle East and West and Central Asia. If you don't think this huge, try building something this large without the help of any drones. It looks like a pretty difficult feat to me. And apparently, Saudi Arabia's desert is filled with more amazing things. Scientists have found mysterious stone structures that are older than the pyramids of Giza in Egypt. So, of course, you can't wait to go check that out. Can we all agree that carrying around heavy rocks to build a pyramid without the help of modern technology sounds absurd? I mean, how on earth did they do it? Now, imagine turning back the clock about 2,000 years into the past and finding humans that built similar gigantic structures in isolated areas. Take a look at these so-called mustadels. They are rectangular structures built from piled up stones, found over 77,000 square miles. Some archaeologists believe that these monuments were used for ritualistic purposes, maybe processions of some kind, where people would walk from one end of the plateau to the other. I'd be down for that. Now let's move on to another deserted area. We're entering the world-famous Sahara Desert landscape. Isn't it beautiful? Here, you're about to unravel an ancient mystery, something that took years for researchers to solve. Fun fact, the Sahara Desert is the world's largest hot desert. It spans over 3 million square miles, which would be like putting a thousand times the country of Hawaii next to each other. We say it's the largest hot desert because the world's largest desert area is Antarctica. But we all know temperatures over there are freezing, not the typical image of when we think of a desert. Deep into the desert, near the Algerian town of Fogaret at Zua, something strange was found. For decades, these tiny dots appeared on images of Google Earth, but nobody could explain what they were. Some scientists were sure that these circles are the result of oil activity in the region. Others guessed that these were ancient fogaras or ancient water wells, there are dozens of them, stretching for miles and miles in a straight line. The strange thing is that they are always far away from any town, road, or human activity in general. So what was or is their purpose? If you had to take a guess, what would you say? Remember we talked about how our ancestors had to be creative in order to survive in the desert? Let's try to walk in their shoes for a minute. Imagine you're a nomadic hunter-gatherer living in a desert area. You spend your days basking in the hot sun, trying to count all the grains of sand around you. But you also need to eat and drink water. But how on earth do you get water in a desert? Sure, you can hope to keep running into oasis every week or so, but that seems a bit risky, doesn't it? That's why North African people invented the so-called fogaras. The fogaras are a 2,500-year-old irrigation system. Locals would dig deep wells in elevated areas, wells deep enough to tap into underground water. Then they would dig parallel shafts at regular distances. This way, 
the water would flow from the main well down into all the shafts and irrigate entire areas. Travelers could stop by the shafts and quench their thirst. They could also raise livestock and tend to crops. Pretty clever, huh? As much as these holes did look like Fogaris, a little bit of research would show you that they're not. You see, these shafts were built in a line and not in a circular shape like the ones we're looking at now. So maybe it has something to do with the second option? Maybe these desert holes were related to oil activity in the region? Let's have a look at the holes up close and personal. From Google Earth, they don't seem that big, but in real life, they are huge craters. The tip to uncovering what they are is hidden beneath the sand. If you were one of the researchers originally uncovering the truth behind this mystery, you would have found something unique hidden in the sand. Old dynamites and vintage sardine cans. Putting the pieces of the puzzle together, scientists found that these sardine cans were a model from the 1950s and 1960s. It seems that entire teams from that decade would camp out while they surveyed the area for oil. And what about the dynamites? These were used for seismic surveying. This is an old technique used to identify if there is oil and gas beneath the Earth's surface. Still in North Africa, you find out about another desert mystery worth exploring. Near the city of Tiaret, southwest of Algeria's capital, one runs into 13 peculiar monuments. These structures are also called Jedars, and yes, I am aware of how much that may sound like a Star Wars reference. They are pyramid-like in their shapes, and as far as scientists know, they were used as final resting places for the people who lived in the region. Can you guess who these were? Most likely the Berber nomads. And since we're talking about ancient stuff, they were probably built between the 4th and 7th centuries CE. Once scientists began to explore the insides of these monuments, they found they were pretty big inside. They found large underground vaults, chambers, and labyrinth-like corridors that gave way to over 20 compartments. It could take you up to two hours to walk around in them, and apparently our ancestors also used its walls to depict images of animals and hunting scenes. There's no definite proof of what these jadars were used for, though. This is so neat, huh? I'm sure that our world's desert is filled with many more mysterious things for us to unravel. I guess I'll see you next time so that we can continue our explorations. We have only explored 5% of the ocean so far. Even this info alone should be enough to make people scared of getting lost in the ocean. On the other part of the spectrum, there are deserts. You need to be in survival mode there too. Shockingly, more people lose their lives from drowning than dehydration in the desert. But what's worse? Being trapped at sea without food? Or getting lost in a desert? Being lost at sea is tougher for a bunch of reasons. There's no hiding from the sun during the day freezing temperatures at night and gusty winds most of the time. You're at the mercy of the sea, and depending on where you are, you might be dealing with massive, 40-foot tall ocean swells. In places like the North Atlantic, staying afloat in the water is a struggle that lasts less than a minute. In wild seas, controlling your ride is a challenge. Capsizing or drifting in a random direction are real risks. The odds of a passing ship spotting and rescuing you are pretty slim unless you're floating in the area where a busy shipping route lies. You might think you can catch some fish, but the ocean might be 3 to 5 miles deep in many places and marine inhabitants are likely to swim way below the surface. Catching them will require special gear, and even if you manage to catch something, you will still have no equipment to cook it. Surviving over a year adrift at sea might sound wild, but experts say it's doable with a bit of luck. One fisherman is living proof of this theory. He was rescued after more than a year of being lost at sea. Jose Alvarenga claimed he had set sail from Mexico in 2012, got carried off, and somehow ended up 5,000 miles away at the Marshall Islands. When he was found, his face was covered with a bushy beard. He had survived by catching fish, birds, and turtles with his bare hands. In tropical waters, having fresh water, staying afloat on a boat or raft, and having shelter from the sun, some food, and a signaling device are crucial. Having a 24-foot long boat and a tarp played a big role in Alvarenga's survival. Generally, five to six weeks without food is the human limit. Catching birds and fish by hand is tricky but if done cleverly, it might work out. 
Smaller turtles can be captured and tossed into the boat, providing fresh meat and preventing scurvy. In open waters, most turtles, birds, and fish are safe to eat raw. Marine toxins in fish are relatively uncommon. It's not that risky. Water is vital too. Rain, bird, and turtle blood, as well as their meat, which is high in water content, might help. In tropical environments, the main dangers are heat, solar radiation, dehydration, skin issues, and animal attacks. Alvarenga seem confused at times because sun exposure, dehydration, and vitamin deficiencies can affect mental state too. As for the desert, it seems to be easier to survive there. There are plants, lizards, and snakes you can munch on. You can stay in the shade during the scorching day and move around when it's cooler, in the evening and morning. We tend to think of the desert as a hot, dry expanse of land, but it can get cold at night. So get ready to build a fire. Starting a fire at night will keep you warm and make it easier for rescuers to spot you if you're lost. Sage and dry bushes make excellent fire starters, so do dry animal droppings. The key to surviving in the desert is conserving water. Focus on maintaining a normal body temperature and keeping your skin shaded from the sun. Find shelter in the shade that allows for a nice breeze. Avoid strolling around under the sun. Skip the drink cactus water myth. That might do more harm than good. The liquid inside cacti is toxic. Even if exhaustion tempts you to lie down, steer clear of the ground if you can. It can be 30 degrees hotter than the air temperature. If you have your car with you, take out the seats and put them on the ground in the shade. Try to figure out what can serve as a decent seat. Aim to keep at least a foot and a half between you and the ground. Shedding clothes might seem like a good idea when the sun is blazing, but it's risky. Exposing your skin to the sun will lead to sunburn and speed up dehydration. Instead, cover up as much of your body as you can and stay away from direct sunlight. One of the major dangers in the desert is flash floods. Ditches, arroyos, and canyons can fill up with water quickly, catching you off guard. Remember, more people have lost their lives from drowning than dehydration in the desert. Stick to high ground and avoid areas that could spell disaster during a heavy downpour. In northern Africa, you can take part in the Marathon de Sable. It's a grueling run that's more than six times longer than a regular marathon. And it all happens in the heart of the desert. Maro, an Italian police officer, decided to join the race in 1994. A sandstorm struck at a certain point along the route, leaving Maro disoriented. Losing his sense of direction, he ran in the wrong direction. He covered several dozen miles before realizing the gravity of his situation. Eventually, he sought refuge in an abandoned shrine in the middle of nowhere. Survival mode kicked in. He summoned the strength for one last dash through the desert, hoping to find help. After being lost for a whole week, he finally stumbled upon an oasis with a little water puddle. But his throat and mouth were so swollen from dehydration that he couldn't swallow much of the water. He was just lying there next to the puddle, taking tiny sips throughout the day. The next morning, he managed to fill up his water container and kept on walking. Later, he spotted some fresh goat marks and that got his attention. Along the trail, he found human footprints. It turned out to be a young girl who was taking care of the goats. When Morrow sprinted towards her, desperately asking for help, he freaked her out at first, but then he finally got rescued. And now let's talk about surviving on a deserted island. There, you have more chances than in the ocean or desert. You can boost your luck by following these steps. Look for freshwater sources, such as streams, waterfalls, or rain. If the place is dry, create a solar still by digging a hole, placing a container inside, and covering it with plastic. Collect rainwater and boil it before drinking. Avoid salt water from the ocean. The next step is to get food. Try to eat only familiar fruits like coconuts and bananas and avoid unknown berries. Seaweed will also do you good. It's possible to prevent scurvy by munching on fresh citrus fruits like lemons and oranges. You can get protein from fish, 
mollusks, and small animals. Sharpen sticks to hunt for fish or birds. Be careful with bigger game and go for slower insects if needed. Cook shellfish thoroughly. Before eating unfamiliar fruits, rub them on your skin and lip to check for adverse reactions. Avoid fruits with a peach or almond smell, as they might be poisonous. Don't waste anything, even if you have extra. Store excess food and water and stick to a plan. I hope you'll never find yourself in this situation. Nelson Netty survived five days on a deserted island near Rio de Janeiro. He got caught in a wave while checking out the view from the rocks near Grumari Beach and ended up on Palmas Island. This 51-year-old gardener found a cave to sleep in on the first night and stumbled upon a tent and a blanket left by fishermen the next day. As the days went by, Mr. Netty got desperate and started drinking seawater. Finally, on Saturday, jet skiers spotted him waving his shirt, and they called the authorities. A helicopter came to the rescue, and that's how Mr. Netty got saved. You're walking along a hot desert under the scorching sun. You run out of supplies. There's no more water. You dream about rain, but there are no clouds in the sky. With each step, you lose more and more strength and fall. You notice a small pond nearby. Is it real water or just a mirage? You can't get to your feet, so you crawl there. The water is getting closer by the minute, but not because you're moving towards it. It's the water approaching you. In a few minutes, the pond area increases. Here, you're already in it. A small lake is formed, 60 feet deep, at the place where the piece of desert was. This real event happened in 2014 in the Tunisian desert. No one knows exactly on what day the lake appeared, since this part of the south of Tunisia is sparsely populated. And first, Shepherds passing by saw the lake and didn't believe their eyes. In the next few hours, hundreds of locals came running to the place. They began to swim, jumping into the water from the surrounding rocks. But a few days later, something strange happened to the lake. In the beginning, it was a crystal clear turquoise blue color, but then it turned dark green. People didn't attach any importance to this and continued to swim. They shouldn't have done that. The scientists and geologists arrived and immediately announced that it wasn't safe to swim in the lake. Muddy green water means the lake is stagnating. It's not refreshed, it's not fed by underground springs. Now the lake is filled with algae and a lot of harmful bacteria that can cause serious diseases. They also found out that this region of Tunisia is filled with huge deposits of phosphate. This substance can disintegrate and leave radioactive traces. The lake can be carcinogenic, toxic, and hazardous for any living organism. But people didn't worry about this too much. They walk in the middle of the desert, while the sun heats the air to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Most of them are unlikely to refuse to jump into cool water, despite the warnings of scientists. Until now, no one knows exactly the reason for the appearance of the lake. Some scientists believe the lake was formed because of heavy rains. The lake is surrounded by rocks and is located inside a canyon. The water could just accumulate after each storm. Some geologists think an earthquake was the cause of the lake. A small seismic activity provoked the rupture of the Earth's rock above the water table. And through this hole, all the water splashed out. And if this theory is correct, then the lake can be pulled back underground through cracks. This is the same as when you pull the plug out of a drain hole in a filled bathtub. Any small earthquake is like pulling the plug out. Therefore, if you find yourself in these places, don't swim in this radioactive lake. We're going to the Caribbean Islands region. Among the clear blue sea, you can find a unique lake. It's located on one of the paradisical islands. You may not even notice the lake right away. The entire territory may seem like a huge concrete platform, but the main thing is not to step on its surface. Pitch Lake is a lake filled not with water, but with liquid asphalt. This is the largest asphalt deposit in the world. Steam is coming from all over the lake as it's hot. The depth of this lake is 250 feet. An entire passenger Boeing could fit there in an upright position. The lake is not fully studied, but scientists believe there's a deep fault in the Earth's crust under it. 
a huge amount of oil seeps through it. It passes through various chemical compounds and turns it into the asphalt. According to rough estimates, there are about 10 million tons of hot material inside this place. Theoretically, no life can exist in such conditions, but scientists have discovered a colony of microbes. Somehow, these creatures have learned to survive here. This also suggests that life outside of our planet may exist. The largest moon of Saturn, Titan, has many hydrocarbon lakes on the surface. And if the simplest forms of life appeared among a million tons of molten asphalt here on Earth, then nothing prevents them from appearing on Titan. We're going to Indonesia, to the island of Java. You need to climb a large volcano to see the next phenomenon. The volcano is overgrown with grass and trees, but it doesn't seem to be sleeping. Smoke is pouring out of its mouth. You climb to the top and see a clear lake instead of boiling magma. The blue sky is reflected in its bright turquoise surface. But don't try to jump there. This lake is filled with acid. The magma inside volcanoes comes from the deep bowels of the Earth's crust. The incandescent liquid consists of many molten metals and chemical compounds, and the lake is filled with particles of these metals. In addition, the volcano emits sulfur dioxide gases. When they combine with metals, they form a beautiful turquoise color. You'd better come back here at night. In some places, a lot of sulfur is concentrated. These accumulations come out of the lake and come into contact with the air. When this happens, everything around bursts into bright blue flame. It's safe to observe this from the side, but don't get too close. Nearby, on this island, there's another acid lake. It also releases sulfurous gases into the air, which are easily ignited when in contact with oxygen. And when this happens, the gases burst into a bright blue electric flame. It's difficult to see the flames during the day. At night, you can see these flashes from afar. Our next location is Australia. You start the drone high above the forest area. Among the green, dense forests, you can see a bright pink spot. It's our lake. This time, the beautiful pink color may not stop you from swimming. You can relax here and take beautiful photos. The lake attracts thousands of tourists, but scientists have only recently been able to find out the reason for the unusual color. At the bottom of this salty lake in Melbourne, special algae grow and secrete a red pigment. In combination with sunlight, high temperatures, and a small amount of precipitation, it turns the lake pink. By the way, Australia is not the only place with such a phenomenon. There are lakes with a pink tinge of water all over the world. You can find them in Senegal, Bolivia, Kenya, and many other countries. The water of these places is also salty and contains the red pigment of unusual algae. We leave the hot beaches and fly to cold Canada. Here, we see a frozen Lake Abraham. We step on the ice and notice huge frozen bubbles inside. They resemble jellyfish, and there are thousands of them there. This is methane. It's a highly flammable substance. The grass, leaves, pieces of trees, and any organic substances that fall into the lake become food for a lot of bacteria that emit methane. Upon contact with frozen water, methane turns into tens of thousands of frozen balls. When the ice melts, the bubbles burst and sizzle. This phenomenon can also be observed on some shores of the Arctic Ocean. There, the size of the bubbles can reach several times more than balloons. It's a beautiful sight, but it's not safe, since methane ignites when it contacts with air. We're in the coldest place of our journey. It's Antarctica, near the driest desert on Earth. A dry place doesn't mean it has to be hot. It's an area with minimum precipitation. The desert isn't sand and cacti, but a place where almost no living life inhabits. Some areas of Antarctica meet these two criteria. However, in this icy desert, you can notice a tiny lake. Its depth is only a few inches. Technically, it's a pond. But the most amazing thing is that it stays in a liquid form. The temperature here drops to negative 58 degrees Fahrenheit, the pond should be frozen, but this doesn't happen. Don Juan Pond is one of the saltiest reservoirs on the planet. The amount of salt here doesn't allow the water to freeze. Scientists have been studying this lake for more than 60 years, but they still can't find out the exact reason for the appearance of water here. 
Under the burning sun, among the sand dunes, somewhere in the Sahara Desert, you're walking in search of an ancient treasure. Finally, you find a strange rock in the sand. It's big, looks like a large piece of black coal or rock, but something shiny on its surface makes the rock unusual. This unique find is the oldest thing that has ever been discovered on our planet. This rock was born long before Earth appeared in outer space. The unusual meteorite was found in 2020, in a remote area of the Sahara Desert. Scientists have analyzed the isotopes of magnesium and aluminum on the stone's surface and found that its age is about 4.5 billion years. At the moment, this is the oldest sample of magma from space in history. It belongs to a small protoplanet that didn't have time to form completely. It happened a very long time ago when our solar system was forming. Many huge asteroids were floating in space. Some of them were formed into huge celestial bodies, which later became planets. The big rocky planets were absorbing the smaller ones. The rock was part of a little protoplanet that just began its formation, but another huge asteroid destroyed it. The planet shattered into billions of pieces. Some of them became part of other planets. Some flew outside the solar system. And one piece that had been wandering in space until our Earth was formed. After that, it hit the planet's atmosphere and fell into the territory now known as the Sahara Desert. The rock was discovered in 2020, but the erosion of extraterrestrial rocks shows that it could have fallen much earlier. This ancient thing weighing around 70 pounds has several pieces of different meteorites inside. In simple words, it's a volcanic rock consisting of lava. It has cooled, solidified, and crystallized. That's why you notice the glitter. Scientists hope that further study of the rock will help to learn more about our solar system foundation. The biggest asteroid discovered in the U.S. is the Willamette. Its size is 84 square feet, and its weight is more than 15 tons. This is half the weight of a bus. Several people can fit on the surface of this outer space object. But the coolest thing is that it's not a rock like most meteorites that were found. Willamette is made of nickel and iron. This massive piece of metal was discovered in 1906. Now, the huge rock is kept at the American Museum of Natural History. The largest meteorite ever found is Hoba. It's located in Namibia, and people have never changed its position because it's too heavy. The weight of Hoba is 60 tons. It's heavier than a tank. The next space-related event occurred on February 28 in southwest England. On this day, a huge flash lit up the sky. Then there was a loud crash. Several residents opened the doors of their houses and noticed a black sooty spot on the lawn. They immediately guessed what had happened and reported the discovery to the British Meteorite Observation Network. If you ever find a meteorite, report it to some geological research or space center as soon as possible. The longer a space rock lies on the ground, the faster it loses its value. Rain, dust, snow, wind, scorching sun, all these factors damage the surface of the meteorite. It makes it difficult to study the celestial object. The meteorite found in England looks like coal, but it's way softer and more fragile. It most likely used to contain frozen water. The rock is part of a huge asteroid that plowed through outer space when our solar system hadn't fully formed yet. They found a unique combination of minerals inside the rock. It can help scientists learn more about the origins of the solar system and life on Earth. Now we're heading to Germany, to the small town of Nördlingen. A huge ancient meteorite's hidden here. It's very difficult to notice it unless you know the secret of this town. You're walking along the cozy little streets and looking at the buildings with beautiful architecture. You spend the whole day there and don't find anything that reminds you of a meteorite. To solve the mystery, you need to get out of town. So you climb a high hill and see that the city is located inside a pit. For a long time, locals were sure the house was located in the crater of an extinct volcano. If you look at the houses from a certain angle, you may notice an unusual shining coming from them. In the middle of the 20th century, a group of geologists came here and immediately declared that the crater doesn't look like a volcanic one. The town was built on a huge crater left by a meteorite. The huge celestial body fell here about 15 million years ago. It was so hot that the carbon bubbles inside instantly turned into small diamonds. 
When people were building this city, they didn't know they were using expensive stones, since the diamonds were hardly visible. The locals never attached importance to the fact that the city walls shine unusually in the sun. Now they believe this place was built from diamonds that had fallen from the sky. Our next stop is in the UK again. This time, the rocks are of an earthly origin. The famous Stonehenge. People place circles of rocks here in a certain order. Everyone knows about this archaeological monument, but no one knows the reason for its creation for certain. Another construction built out of mysterious rocks was discovered just two miles away. It's called Superhenge. It's bigger, heavier, and takes up more space. Each plate here is 15 feet, which is about the height of two floors. Once, the stone stood vertically and formed a huge semicircle. But someone pushed the stones over about 4,500 years ago. It was a college prank. No, not really. That's why they couldn't be detected for a long time. Scientists still can't solve the mystery of Superhenge, but they believe the standing vertical stones were part of some huge monument. Some other amazing rocks are located in the south of Costa Rica. There are big ones the size of a human, and there are smaller ones the size of bowling balls. And they all have a perfectly round shape. These giant rocky spheres were created by people. It must have taken years of polishing using stone tools to get the perfect round shape. These balls are incredibly heavy, but can easily roll like a basketball. All the rocks are of a different age. Some of them were created about 2,500 years ago. Most of them are made of molten volcanic magma. Until now, scientists don't know for what purpose these stones were used. They were found in different parts of Costa Rica, near big cities. It's possible that ancient civilizations installed them specifically to show the greatness of local kings. Also, many experts believe the rocks were used as a tool for studying astronomy. The people who knew their purpose of the rocks had disappeared, and the history of the stones was lost along with them. Let's finish our journey with the coolest archaeological find. You're walking through the desert of Peru and climbing a low hill. You look down and notice the surface of the hill is covered with strange lines. You walk far away and see a huge cat on the hill. Such a drawing is called a geoglyph. Its length is around 120 feet which is about half the size of a Boeing commercial jet. Archaeologists discovered the giant cat in 2020 and found out that it had been created somewhere between 200 and 100 BCE. This huge drawing is part of a mysterious group of different pictures. In addition to the cat, there are other animals, plants, and fantastic figures. All of them were found in the desert of Peru. The kitten was found by chance. Archaeologists didn't see it at first, because natural erosion on the hillside had almost erased the silhouette. The freezing temperatures of the Arctic Circle, intense off-road driving and the searing heat of the Sahara Desert, not to mention wild animals that are ready to pounce without warning. That's what a journey of a giant block of ice looked like. The thing was moved from the Arctic Circle all the way to the scorching equator in the back of a pickup truck. Rewind back to 1959, when the world was going through some tough times and a cola cost you a nickel. Radio Luxembourg presented its listeners with a challenge. It was to transport three tons of ice from the Arctic Circle to the equator. Anyone could take part in this adventure. The only condition, and a tough one at that, was that no refrigerator could be used throughout the journey. To make things even spicier, they offered a reward for those who could do it. A whopping 50,000 frogs for each pound of ice that remained at the end of the journey, which would be around $9,000 per pound these days. And if someone managed to deliver the entire block, they could get around $50 million. As soon as the challenge was announced, the guys from the radio just kicked back and waited for the laughs to pour in. But Buryer Notvik wasn't laughing. At that time, he needed money to develop his business, which was manufacturing glass wool insulation. If the man succeeded, he could help his family and employees. So his company, Glossbot, based in Norway, took on the challenge and surprised everyone around, especially the radio station. 
It seemed to be an impossible task. No one had ever accomplished such a feat. The total distance was around 5,000 miles, all in the boiling sun. It would probably melt the entire ice block even before it reached the shores of Europe. But Burrier was a smart man and had a brilliant plan up his sleeve. The radio company figured out what the man was going to do. They realized how much they would lose if he were to succeed. The result? They canceled the entire money reward. When Burrier heard of the news, he was at a loss. He'd already gone to the Arctic Circle and prepared to excavate some ice. Luckily, before he knew it, the situation gathered so much media attention that sponsors from eight different countries lined up to support Notvik's journey. Famous petrol company Shell provided his expedition with fuel, and transport manufacturer Scania gave them a pickup truck. Burrier Notvik and his team started to cut through ice. Of course, they couldn't get a single piece that would weigh three tons. That's why they chopped up several 450-pound blocks of ice. And then they transported all those pieces by helicopter to the town center. Then they melted them together to create a giant chunk of ice. After that, the ice was supposed to be placed in the back of a large pickup truck. But it wasn't enough to prevent mm. it from melting. And the team couldn't use any methods of refrigeration. Burrier decided to put the ice in a specially constructed iron container insulated with glass wool and wood. It would keep the ice more or less intact without breaking the rules of the challenge. It was a very clever way of insulating. Glass wool is made of melted glass fibers. The air gets trapped between the thin glass strands and can't flow out. This way, there are no dramatic temperature changes. Along with the massive chunk of ice, the truck also carried around 650 pounds of medicines. They had to be delivered to a hospital that was on the way of the expedition. On February 22, 1959, the epic journey across the continents began. It started in Norway. Then the team traveled through Copenhagen, Hamburg, Brussels, Paris, and Marseille. In Europe, almost everyone knew about the unusual journey. Notvik and his people were greeted with cheers and claps as they drove through large cities and small towns. The roads were well paved and weather conditions didn't bring any problems. News spread even further south when the expedition reached Paris. By that time, they'd already become celebrities. The police even escorted them through some of the busiest streets to make way for the truck carrying the ice. The mayor invited Burrier and his team for lunch. The ice was in good condition until it arrived at the port of Marseille. That's when things started to look challenging. The team had to use a crane to lift the pickup truck and load it on the ship. It was supposed to take them to the coast of Algeria. Notvik and his people realized they were about to start the most difficult part of the trip. Bye-bye to the cool landscapes of Europe. They'd have to endure the scorching sun of the desert before being able to finish their trip. Soon enough, they were on their way to the final destination. But the ice was melting away much faster than before. That's why the expedition had to move at an ever-increasing speed. But it turned out to be challenging. It was almost impossible not to get stuck in the sand. At that time, the Sahara had no paved roads for miles on end. So, Burrier and his crew had to dig their heavily loaded car out of the sand in the scorching sun. Every day, the temperatures got higher and higher. Sometimes, it was hotter than 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The truck got stuck more and more often. The ice was melting faster than before. It seemed to be just a matter of time before all they were transporting across the Sahara was a large swimming pool filled with cool water. And still, no one was ready to give up and to go back home. They made camps in the desert during the nights and kept driving during the days. The finish line was right there. They came across many friendly nomadic tribes that were traveling on camels' backs. These desert dwellers helped the expedition with some food. In return, the crew offered them the most unique water the locals would ever have, melted ice from the Arctic. 
Nomads know how to survive the extreme temperatures of the Sahara Desert. They're accustomed to such an unusual lifestyle. But they would have tough times without camels. Often called the ships of the desert, these unique animals store fat in their humps. When camels can't find any food or water in the desert, they turn this fat into energy. Anyway, after many days under the burning sun, Natvik and his people finally left the desert and entered the jungle of Gabon. Soon, they reached Libreville, their final destination. Many locals gathered around to witness history in the making and one of the most bizarre road trips ever. The ice was still in one piece, Burrier and his crew were in one piece, and it only took them 27 days to get from Norway to Libreville. <laughs> Not bad. But the main question was how much ice had melted away? They weighed it and did all the necessary calculations, and then their jaws dropped. At the beginning of their journey, the weight of the ice block was 6,700 pounds, but now the ice measured to be 6,000 pounds, which meant that only around 700 pounds of ice had melted away, even after it had traveled halfway across the world through different countries and different climates. The whole world was shocked to find out about the outcome mm. of the expedition. Apparently, if you transported a giant block of ice from the Arctic Circle to the equator, you'd only lose 11% of that ice along the way. Notvik gave most of the ice to the locals. These people had never seen or touched frozen water before. The rest of the ice was flown back home to Norway. It was then used for the drinks at numerous press conferences. The return journey was much easier. The members of the expedition simply flew back by plane. Charles de Gaulle, the president of France at that time, offered to personally greet them in Paris if they drove back by truck. But the exhausted team declined. Nothing would make them drive through the desert again. The journey was a success, even though there was no reward money for the challenge. The expedition reached its goal, and Burrier attracted worldwide attention to his company and its products. Ah, the desert welcomes you with challenging conditions of abandoned environments and extreme temperatures. Hey, some of us would prefer dessert, chocolate over sand and rocks. Oh well, just like cactuses and camels, buildings have had to adapt to these conditions. Here are some examples of astonishing structures in deserts. These structures are called earthships. They're located in a New Mexico desert town. A large community of like-minded people lives in them. What's even more interesting is that the location of these buildings is registered as dumpsters. Maybe it's because all these structures are made out of old tires, bottles, and cans. Earthships operate using green building principles. About 40% of a typical earthship is built with natural or recycled materials. Imagine the walls made up of hundreds of used tires packed with dirt. Then there are layers of floor-to-ceiling passive solar windows. They gather the sunlight during winter and reflect it in the summer to keep the structures at a reasonable room temperature. You can see plants in corridors and glass bottles or aluminum cans stuffed inside walls. Certainly a distinct house in many ways. Mike Reynolds is an architect who noticed the alarming waste and consumption levels in the 1970s. He designed a fully sustainable home out of cans back then. Almost 40 years later, he becomes the one who brings together all the other earth shippers. Reynolds drove a Mercedes, but it ran off of the vegetable oil he picked up at fast food restaurants in town. A standard two-bedroom, two-bathroom earthship costs about $250,000 in this town. Yet there are earthships, like Dobson House, that can cost as much as $1.5 million. If you do it yourself, you know, with family and friends, you can eliminate the cost of labor, and it becomes relatively less expensive. Let's assume you're really going to build one. Where can it be? Well, anywhere. Earthships currently fit in the cold, dry air of Canada, as well as the hot and humid climate of Haiti. This is the Mirage Mirror House. It's an installation set in the Southern California desert. Mirage opened in 2017 as part of a contemporary art exhibition. It's composed of mirrors. This minimalistic structure blends with the environment around it. The doors, windows, and openings have been removed to create an amazing experience. What you have in the landscape is reflected back to you. How's it made? With mirrored surfaces. 
At night, the distant lights refract from the mirrors. In the daytime, the sky is transformed into banks of clouds. There's no fixed scenery in this house. How about seeing a futuristic structure in the deep desert? Architect designed a concept home that pairs perfectly with Elon Musk's Cybertruck. The house has a post-apocalyptic theme. I mean, when I say post-apocalyptic, it's because I can't say it. Anyway, the house is designed to survive in a disaster scenario. The cyber house has steel gates, the windows are armored, and the exterior walls are made out of super strong material. Modern house is controlled by an autonomous geothermal heat pump. To put it in less sci-fi terms, you can keep the internal temperature steady. This sleek house has an entrance that can fit the Cybertruck. After all, it's inspired by it in the first place. Plus, the Cybertruck can be lifted to the second floor to be more secure. This is King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center in Saudi Arabia. Basically, it's a laboratory in a desert. It was designed to demand minimum energy. The architecture has patterns on the walls and ceilings, giving reference to the local tradition of geometric form. The next stop is Swartberg House in South Africa. This one is located near the Swartberg Mountains, but don't get too excited. It's on the edge of the Great Karoo Desert. It's a four-bedroom apartment. It has a special temperature regulating system. The system works like a shield from the heat in the summer and as a sun trap in the winter. You're looking at the Grand Mosque of Jene in Mali. This mosque is 52 feet tall. This is impressive because it's made of only sticks and a special mix of mud and other natural elements found in the desert. Petra is an ancient city hidden in the Jordan Desert. The structures are carved directly into red, white, and pink-colored sandstone cliff faces. It's located among the canyons and mountains near the desert. The place was a trade center many, many years ago. You might already see pictures of the impressive facade of the treasury. This structure still holds many mysteries in it. For starters, scientists can't explain how the Nabataeans managed to create such a structure thousands of years ago. Did you know that there's another mysterious place in the middle of the desert that has a similar structure to Petra? Medayan Saleh was like a second capital of the Nabataean kingdom. Yet another secret they left for us to decipher. It has over 100 decorated tombs and more than a thousand non-monumental graves. Plus, inscriptions and cave drawings are also here, again surrounded by sandstone. This wooden shack was a post office once. The structure is in the Tengger Desert of Mongolia. It's surrounded by mm, nothing. Sand is the only thing that accompanies the lonely structure. The building is only 23 square inches. As you can guess, it didn't get too many visitors. It was abandoned for over 35 years. Its fate changed one day when a woman discovered the building. Mrs. Zhang and her friend came up with an idea. They were going to reach businesses and people who wanted to send letters and postcards from the world's loneliest post office without actually visiting the place. It worked. The post office rarely gets visitors in place, but it's busy online. Over 20,000 letters and postcards were sent from the desert post office in December 2021 alone. The place is about 6 miles off the nearest road. A post truck picks the letters up and hits the road for delivery. Eventually, they are shipped all over the world. A second destination in Saudi Arabia is King Abdulaziz Center for World Culture. The building has an interesting design. It took nearly a decade to build this complex structure. It's a 321-foot-tall tower which stands out with its look. Stone Matters Pavilion is a stone structure in Palestine. The structure spans a surface area of 93 square inches. It has been built entirely out of 300 interlocking stones that mutually support each other. The concave roofs, and yes, they look like giant bowls, are designed that way to collect rainwater. The structure is in Iran. Interestingly, in Iran, the evaporation rate is three times faster than the world average, so this bowl-like design comes in very handy. It captures the water in a way that the water can form a single mass as a whole before it evaporates. The outer shell of the roof system collects rainwater, but it also works as an additional shading. It makes air move freely, designed like a cooling mechanism for both roofs. Eco Lodge in Egypt is the next stop. The project is built in a place that overlooks the desert and is constructed using locally available materials like sun-fired bricks and palm wood. The building is an example of traditional architecture. There's a water basin that lets in the air to keep the interior cool.
A worthy mention is the CID Interpretation Center in Chile. Chile's Atacama Desert is among the top tourist destinations in the country. To help the tourists, architects designed a visitor's center as part of the infrastructure for the wind farm. Here, the cold winter months don't freeze people because the large windows make the most of solar heating. What's even more interesting is that the building is designed to go completely dark at night. Imagine you somehow bumped into the building by accident. Black Desert House is a building respecting the stars. At night, this house goes completely dark. It dissolves into the night, so the stars can appear more prominent. Now, any mysterious desert buildings you know that aren't on this list? Let us know in the comments. You plan to spend your summer vacation in Africa. The final destination is the Sahara Desert. It's located in northern Africa, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. You're excited to ride camels and learn about the region's rich cultures. You hop on an extensively long flight, and finally, you are here. You find yourself in the world's biggest hot desert. Can you believe it's 3 million square miles? You're ready for your first adventure after drinking liters of ice-cold water. The guide gives you a choice. You can spend two weeks visiting a collection of oases, or you can help them solve an ongoing local mystery. Deep into the desert, near this Algerian town, lies a mystery begging to be solved. A collection of huge, spotted circles in the sand. There are dozens of them, stretching for miles in a straight line. The circles were first identified via Google Earth images several years ago. People have debated them for years, but no one seems to know the answer. The strange thing is that they are so many miles away from any towns, roads, or human activity. The quickest way to discover the truth behind the circles is asking questions. You grab your notebook and set up to talk to locals. Everyone is helpful in this scenario – geographers, anthropologists, elders, and historians. The first person you talk to is a map expert. You need to understand if those circles were authentic or a satellite glitch. You end up interviewing the people who take Google Earth satellite pictures. The circles are really there. They appear in multiple pictures from many years. Then, let's understand why they are there in the first place. After two days of interviews, you have your first lead. The circles could be the result of oil activity. Experts explained why this would make sense. Algeria is a rich area for natural resources, so this would be a sensible guess. Usually, to find out if there is anything worth extracting, companies would undertake seismic surveys. Seismic surveys are a way of analyzing the Earth's surface by sending shock waves into the ground. Depending on how these waves bounce back, you'll know what is located there. A special vehicle could have marked the soil that way. So, did we unravel the mystery? Mm, not quite so. As you know, the Sahara Desert is one of the driest areas on the planet. The average high temperatures in summer are over 104 degrees Fahrenheit. To survive there, people need to find ways of accessing water. So, these circles could be a kind of ruin or leftovers from ancient water wells. Again, I'd say this is a sensible guess. Ready for some fact-checking? Some anthropologists agree that these circles could be ancient fogueras. Fogera is the name of a 2,500-year-old style of irrigation system, usually found in northern Africa. It is also known as a kanat in other places in northern Africa. Locals would dig a deep well at an elevated point, deep enough to tap into underground water. They would then dig parallel shafts at regular distances. Then, they would dig an underground channel that connected the city to the well. Solely with the help of gravity, water would run from the well to the city. This traditional technology provided water for crops, livestock, and humans. Now, let's say these wells made human-made oases possible. Even the closest municipality name was an indication that this could be true. The name Fagaret Esaoya is actually named after Fagrets, these ancient wells. Now, this lead was proving to be very accurate. You decide to travel over there to see for yourself. You take a local bus, sit back, and enjoy the ride. The landscape in northern Algeria is filled with ancient-looking towns. You even see ruins of wells along the way, on the outskirts of smaller cities. Opening Google's satellite images, you can see the Kanat's markings on the ground. 
a series of holes running down several miles. But as soon as you arrive, you find out you were wrong. Dale Lightfoot, one of the world's leading experts on canots, said that the circles were definitely not canots. Even the satellite images confirm this difference. Uh-oh, we were so close! Apparently, canots or fogras would not run down a straight line. They wouldn't be shaped like circles. Another clue that this wasn't the case was that there were no towns at the end. The circles were really far away from any human activity. And canots were explicitly built to provide water for human settlements. Well, it sure was a good try. You almost gave up on this mystery when you decided to take one more field trip. It was days of preparation, pick up cars, food, equipment, all so that the mystery of the Sahara circles could be unraveled. On the first day, you drove over 99 miles into the desert. You were always curious to see what this part of the world looked like. Over there, you see nothing but mustard yellow dunes. The night sky is pretty decent, though. You can see the entire Milky Way with your own eyes. You set up camp and sleep under a canopy of stars. The next day, tension grows. There's no cell reception. Oh dear. But thankfully, you added the coordinates of the circles to your Google map. And surprise, the offline mode works out there. You follow the coordinates, but it leads you astray. You start to get nervous, thinking this was all in vain. But you and the team get into the car and drive a few more miles past the coordinates on your phone. After a very bumpy ride, you can't believe your eyes. There it is, an enormous crater dug on the sand, surrounded by 12 smaller holes. From up high, it looks like a clock. Without the pointers, of course. On the ground, they're very faint. So faint, you almost miss them. Searching the area, you notice all the holes had something similar. Metal wires. Thin wires that you can pull from the ground. They're buried deep, so you start digging. An object starts to reveal itself. Uh Uh-oh! It looks like old dynamite. This certainly surprises you. Um, better stop digging to avoid any accidents. At the end of the survey, you feel satisfied, but still curious. What could all this dynamite mean? And who put it there? What comes next is the turning point of your adventure. Walking back to the car, you see something shining on the ground. You approach the item with curiosity. It's round and rusty and looks like a sardine can. What's that doing here? Could this give you more clues about the circle's mystery? Just in case, you pick it up and put it in the car. Back in the city, the puzzle pieces start to reveal the story behind the Sahara circles. You bring photos and the sardine can and show them to local experts. They analyze your material and give you an intriguing verdict. As it turns out, guess number one was the closest one to the truth. So what happened to the first guess? Why do we need to keep digging deeper? Well, because it was only half right. The Sahara circles are not a historical footprint of seismic surveying. Back when the circles were made, this technology didn't even exist. But they sure are related to oil exploration. The dynamite-filled holes were an old method for oil searching. The circles are the leftovers of surveyors looking for resources underground. And the sardine cans? Well, they were left by the workers who held explosion works. You gotta eat, right? According to the model of the can, this happened more or less around the 1950s and 1960s. So these circles aren't even that ancient. More like modern ones, if you ask me. Well, well, well. Hope you are glad you tagged along and helped unravel this mystery. See you in the next mystery-solving adventure. You find yourself in Africa, land of unique wildlife, home to a great variety of cultures and languages, and, first and foremost, host to the world's largest hot desert, the Sahara. It's daytime, and you are thirsty for some water and shade. You've been walking for days, trying to find one of those precious-looking oases. You feel you're near, but the horizon just keeps stretching and stretching. Your mind is tired, and your body is feeling all the heat. It's like you've eaten a full plate of hot pepper and then some more, judging by how much you're sweating. And when I say hot, think 100 degrees Fahrenheit hot on average. No wonder this is happening. After all, you find yourself in the world's biggest hot desert. Now I say hot desert, 
since the biggest deserted landscapes are actually the cold ones, located in Antarctica and the Arctic. Icy Antarctica's frozen desert is more or less the size of 1 million LAXs. Yep, the Los Angeles International Airport. The Arctic Desert is just a bit smaller than that. Now, in case you don't know, the Sahara Desert is located in northern Africa, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean all the way over to the Red Sea. It occupies an area large enough to place approximately 100,000 Disney World theme parks side by side. According to scientists, its boundaries are expanding. Deserts usually form in the subtropics because of what's called Hadley circulation. The air rises at the equator and descends into the subtropics. This circulation of air has a drying effect, which helps the formation of desert landscapes. Since the 1920s, the Sahara is considered to have expanded by over 10%. How is this happening? Well, let's start from the beginning. You probably know the Sahara Desert as one of the most inhospitable places on Earth today. Just FYI, for a place to be considered a desert, it has to receive less than 4 inches of rain per year. Due to the very small precipitation index, deserts are usually dry and arid places. There is little humidity in the air, and daytime temperatures can go as high as 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Usually, there isn't that much animal and plant life because of the lack of water. But in the Sahara's case, it wasn't always like that. It may be difficult to imagine northern Africa without the tons of sand it has today. But about 20,000 years ago, the Sahara was actually one big oasis. Recent discoveries show clear evidence of what the scientists now call the Green Sahara. In the mid-1800s, a German explorer crossing the Sahara encountered some paintings and engravings that nomad artists had left behind. What he saw in those paintings looked nothing like his actual surroundings. Instead of an arid landscape with only camels and desert vegetation, the rock paintings depicted jungle animals like giraffes and hippos. There were even images of livestock and grazing animals such as cattle and sheep, something that seems impossible for modern-day Sahara. Artists usually draw what they see around them, so this finding really intrigued the German explorer. The drawings were so detailed that the artists must have had close contact with those animals. You can find this rock art spread out in the northern part of the African continent, from Western Sahara to Saudi Arabia. Geologists soon took a keen interest in this and found the first clues to what this could mean. They have been able to confirm that, in fact, northern Africa was once much wetter. They found evidence from nearby deep-sea sediment off the coast of Mauritania. Sampled cores of underwater sand and mud, known as Saharan dust flux, show geologists that, indeed, a green Sahara was possible. The more dust is blowing off of the desert and into the bottom of the ocean, the drier the climate in the region. The sediment cores show that there was much less dust, only half as much, coming off northern Africa during the humid period. This period has to do with Earth's natural cycles. Normally, the Earth rotates at a tilt of 23.5 degrees. But this angle is not consistent and changes over time. Earth's tilt is responsible for the amount of sunlight each hemisphere receives. It affects several ecosystem functions on the planet. During the time of the Green Sahara, the Earth received between 4 and 8% more sunlight than it does today. So when the Earth tilted about 20,000 years ago, the northern hemisphere received more direct sunlight, which affected humidity levels in the region. As the northern hemisphere got warmer, this affected monsoon activity. More specifically, the West African monsoon. Monsoons are wind systems that affect a region's rainfall index and humidity levels. As a part of the globe gets warmer, it allows for more air to rise. It combines with the wind to draw moisture up into the atmosphere. Little by little, northern Africa also became wetter. The increased moisture made the Sahara so wet that there were actual bodies of water in the region. As vegetation grew, the plants held on to moisture better than bare sand could. There is evidence of natural basins throughout the Sahara and lakes so big they would fit all of the U.S.'s Great Lakes inside of them. Archaeologists uncovered evidence of vibrant societies in what are now arid areas. It looks like ancient cultures were able to take full advantage of the African humid period. According to researchers, the human population peaked across the Sahara about 9,000 years ago. There are traces of fireplaces, hunting tools, fish hooks, and even mounds of fish bones. 
Records show that there have been over 230 green periods over the span of 8 million years. Solar radiation is always changing due to natural orbital cycles. That's why Earth will most certainly see another green Sahara moment. It might be thousands of years from now, but it will happen. The same way the Sahara turns green, it turns yellow again. Let's put it like that. All it takes is a significant axial tilt and a few years of readjusting. However, another phenomenon is calling the attention of scientists now. Recent studies by the National Science Foundation from the University of Maryland show the Sahara has expanded 10% over the past 90 years. This phenomenon is called desertification, which literally means fertile land turning into desert land. The Sahara Desert is now advancing into the semi-arid region of Sahel. In 1950, this region was home to 31 million people. Today, its population is over 100 million people. This rapid population growth has largely contributed to the Sahara's expansion. Farmers that were once nomads began settling down. Land usage grew more intense, aiding in weakening the soil. The demand for food has caused an overcropping of the land, so even more of it is turning into the desert now. The study also shows that natural climate cycles can affect rainfall in the Sahara and the Sahel. Scientists affirm that all deserts fluctuate, not only the Sahara. A desert's boundary may expand in the dry winter and contract during the wetter summer. South of the Sahara lies the Chad Basin. It is a natural body of water that now serves as an indicator of the Sahara's expansion. The Chad Basin is located in the region where the Sahara is advancing southward. An atmospheric and ocean expert from the University of Maryland explains that rainfall has reduced greatly in the entire region. Due to reduced rainfalls, there is less water across the entire basin, and even Chad Lake is drying out. Just like the Sahara, the Atacama Desert in Chile, deemed the world's driest, is also expanding. It is located north of the city of Santiago, and its southern border is expanding toward the Chilean capital. Because the climate is getting drier and drier here, the city of Santiago is turning into an arid or semi-arid region itself. The once fertile valleys of local rivers that lived on agriculture and livestock for many generations are losing their revenues as Chilean land is turning into a desert. Since 2010, Santiago has received only a third of its annual rainfall. Outside of the city, farmers are digging holes in search of blue gold, or simply put, water. The situation here is very similar to that of Sahel. So tell me this. Were you as surprised as I was to find out what has been happening in the Sahara region? Feel free to share in the comments below. Octopuses have three hearts. Two of them pump blood to the gills, while the bigger heart circulates blood to the rest of their body. They also have nine brains. There's the large central one, but also each of their eight arms has a mini brain of its own, which is why they can act independently. Since each arm has its own brain, the central brain only needs to send a higher-level signal to the arm. Things like, move to that nearby crevice, there might be a crab hiding inside. In the case of humans, the brain would guide and take control of each movement of our legs and arms. And with an octopus, arms act almost independently on their way to the crevice. It also tastes and feels with the suction cups on it. Since their arms are so independent, an octopus doesn't actually know where they are unless it sees them. The human body has an ability called proprioception. Thanks to it, we know where our arm is, even if we hold it, let's say, behind our back. 1816 is known as the year when summer didn't come. In April 1815, there was a massive explosion on Mount Tambora in Indonesia. It sent enormous clouds of volcanic ash up into the atmosphere. The majority of the northern hemisphere got covered with a shroud of dust and dirt and kind of refused to settle. In June of the following year, the cold winter didn't just come to an end. Frost damaged crops and snow and rain persisted during the whole summer. In Iceland, you'll find some of the most breathtaking sceneries on our planet. Jagged mountains, fjords, hot geysers, ice fields carved into the landscape. Stunning yet intriguingly black sand beaches, such as Reynisfjara Beach. Most of the sand on beaches is generally formed from rocks that have broken down because of weather changes and erosion through thousands or even millions of years. And on Reynisfjara, 
the sand is a striking black color, and that's because of volcanic activity. Lava came out of an erupting volcano, got to the surface, cooled, and then hardened in the Atlantic Ocean, creating such a fascinating black cube. This beach is so magically stunning, but it's also very dangerous because of its sneakier waves. That's when a few smaller waves join together into a single, really big one. This phenomenon can happen when ocean currents force waves together, or in the case of Rainosphera, when such waves come from an offshore underground cliff and get an even stronger pulling effect. Considering the ocean's low temperatures too, it's definitely better to just take pictures from a safe spot. Some trees talk to each other. Eh, not the way we do, of course, but for example, acacia trees that grow over the African savanna can warn each other if there's something dangerous coming. When some animals, such as antelopes, gobble up its leaves, the tree immediately starts producing more tannin, which is toxic to animals. They also emit a special type of gas that travels through the air and warns other trees they should protect themselves too. You're stargazing. Such a chill night. And then a flash of bright light streaks through the night sky. A shooting star. So cool. But what we see is not actually a star, although we call it that way. They're meteors, which are basically small chunks of dust and rock moving through space. As they're passing through our atmosphere, they cause something called friction when one thing rubs against another. And that's why they glow. Also, the friction causes heat. Dust and rocks get extremely hot as they fly through the atmosphere, and the heat makes them glow until the moment they burn out and turn into what we call the shooting star. Sunsets in deserts are extremely beautiful because of the spectacular colors they produce a bit more than elsewhere. Sunlight consists of various shades of the color spectrum. When the sun is high in the sky, these colors mix together and our eyes see them as white. But as the sun gets lower, its rays have to go through a thicker layer of atmosphere before they get to us. The atmosphere then scatters shorter wavelengths of light, like blue and purple, before we can even see them. That's why the longer orange and red wavelengths stand out. In urban environments, air pollution can make sunset colors duller than everywhere. The clean air in deserts allow the vivid colors coming from the sun to shine through at twilight. Also, the moisture, water vapor, and rain engorged clouds can mute the sunset's hues. Since there's no rain, clouds are thin and wispy, so they filter and reflect sunlight instead of blocking it. Bamboo grows really fast. It's actually the fastest growing plant on Earth, sometimes growing about 3 feet in just one day. You can find it in dense forests, where only a little light gets to the ground. Which means bamboo is under strong pressure to reach the sunlight as quickly as it can. There's an underground stem that connects bamboo shoots to their parent plant. So the shoot doesn't really need leaves of its own until it gets to its full height. Also, bamboo grows faster than other plants because it doesn't waste its time and energy on growing rings that thicken the stalk. It's just a thin, hollow stick that grows straight up. You'll notice some of the big trees have shallow root systems, sometimes even 10 inches deep in the ground. The roots generally need access to oxygen and water, and they can mostly find it in special underground pockets called soil pores. When a tree has ideal moisture and soil conditions, it can send roots deeper down under the surface and get what it needs. But most of the time, conditions are not perfect, considering bedrock, stones, and compact soil that physically prevents the roots from going down. Such obstacles also prevent the roots from getting the needed oxygen. So, when life gets tough, the tree will take an easier option. Its roots will stay close to the surface and spread out in different directions. Drought conditions are another reason trees can have shallow root systems. By staying closer to the surface, they can take most of the rainfall collection. Plants are exposed to the sunlight most of the time, but they still don't get sunburned. They appeared on land about 700 million years ago. And one of the key things they needed to survive was something that would protect them against the ultraviolet rays coming from the sun. Those in the sea had seawater as protection. UV radiation is mostly responsible for sunburn. So land plants developed a special protein that detects it. This protein sends signals to the cells to protect the plant from the damage and effects of UV radiation. Basically, it's like they produce their own natural sunscreen. But this still doesn't mean they're 100% protected. 
You know that common belief that if you water plants in the midday sunshine, this can cause their sunburn? Some think droplets of water act as tiny lenses and then focus the sunlight onto the leaf surface. But they're not strong enough to actually focus sunlight from a water droplet onto the surface of a leaf. It's just that their natural sunscreen doesn't mean total protection. Too much exposure to UV radiation damages cells in the leaves and bark of the majority of plants. Earth's core is as hot as the surface of the sun. You'd think it could easily melt our entire planet, especially since the core is only 1,800 miles away from the surface. If the sun were so close, we'd be like french fries. But we're alive because the center of the sun is surrounded by a mantle of rock that's mostly solid. The crust we walk on actually floats on that mantle and protects us. If the sun was close, we'd only have empty space to protect us and you and I wouldn't be talking. Also, to melt the entire planet, you'd need way more energy than the heat in its core. So there. This is the Burj Khalifa. It's the tallest building in the world. It has 163 floors, and it's twice as tall as the Empire State Building, and three times taller than the Eiffel Tower. The total weight of the concrete for the building's foundation is 110,000 tons. That's like 2,200 Boeing 737s, or 50,000 SUVs, or 69,000 hippos. It took 22 million human hours to build. That means that if you were to build Burj Khalifa by yourself, it would take you about 2,500 years to do it. And now, imagine that huge thing slowly sinking into the sand until even its spire is underground. Skyscrapers are usually built on solid ground. Take a skyscraper in New York and dig a little deeper under it. There's always some kind of rock foundation to support the weight of the building. But if you dig a hole in Dubai, you'll only find sand. In theory, The whole city should have sunk in the sand, but it's still there. The main reason the Burj Khalifa stands firm is that the sand for the building's foundation was brought from Australia. Wait, but Dubai is built in a desert. There are billions of tons of sand there. Well, that's right, but the problem is its shape. There are lots of dust storms there. The wind picks up sand grains. They rub against one another, get polished, and gradually turn into microscopic balls. This makes the sand doughy, almost like snow. And if you squeeze a handful of such sand, there will be a lot of air between these balls. That's because they don't cling to one another tightly. But usually, sand grains are shaped like diamonds. If you squeeze such sand in your hand, the grains will press against one another like puzzle pieces. This way, they can withstand intense pressure. So engineers imported millions of tons of sand to Dubai to create a strong base for the foundation of the building. The second thing about this type of sand is friction. The less smooth it is, the harder it is for you to slide on it. The building will literally cling to the sand with its foundation. Now, let's sneak a peek underneath the Burj Khalifa. First, the engineers drilled 192 holes, each about 164 feet deep. That's three times the length of a New York City subway car. Then, these holes were filled with concrete and about 39,000 tons of steel rebars to reinforce the structure. These are called piles. Concrete resists compression well enough, but it doesn't fare well when it gets twisted or bent. Luckily, steel rebars are great at dampening those forces. The sand around the piles is tight against the concrete. The friction between the sand and the piles keeps them from falling deeper. It's like sticking your hand in the sand at the beach. It can easily go down a dozen inches, but then the friction will stop it. When the piles were ready, it was time to create the base of the building, something like a concrete pillow. It's shaped like a flower with three petals, but this is not only for beauty, it's also for reliability. When you step on doughy snow with your feet, you fall all the way down to more solid ground. But if you wear snowshoes, you can walk on the snow surface. This is because your weight is distributed over the snowshoe area. The shape of the base of the Burj Khalifa has the same function. It distributes the construction's weight evenly, so that the building doesn't sink into the sand. When the base was ready, workers began constructing the building itself. Whoa, it really swings a bit. Don't worry, it's done on purpose so that the skyscraper doesn't collapse. If you make the construction too stiff and don't let it swing, at one point, 
a strong gust of wind can just break it at the very base, and it will fall. So all skyscrapers are made a bit flexible. When the wind blows, the skyscraper tilts a little. This puts a lot of force on one side of the building's foundation. But concrete tends to shrink slightly, which dampens that force. Then the concrete decompresses and returns back to normal. When the wind is especially strong, the spire of the Burj Khalifa can sway six and a half feet. The architects have come up with an even crazier idea for Dubai, a spinning building. It'll be an ordinary skyscraper, but each floor will rotate 360 degrees. Engineers are planning to install a rigid rod inside the skyscraper. It'll hold the entire weight of the construction on itself. Then each floor of the building will be attached to that rod, and the inhabitants of each floor will be able to choose the direction and speed of rotation. So, building on sand is actually quite reliable and simple. It was much harder to build skyscrapers in Manhattan. There's hard rock that can support a skyscraper there, but it lies 10 stories deep underground. So, engineers came up with a solution. These are wells. First, a concrete ring is placed on the ground. Workers start digging a hole right underneath it. They remove soft soil, and the concrete ring begins to sink under its own weight. The builders then put another ring on top of it and continue digging. One by one, the rings go lower and lower. A small crane helps to lift the soil to the surface. It's essentially a vertical tunnel that leads to nowhere. When the well reaches the rock hidden underneath the soil, the builders climb back to the top. The well is then filled with concrete. It looks like a giant pile. A dozen of these powerful piles can support a large skyscraper. But it's much harder to create a building foundation in a seismically active zone. That means a place where earthquakes frequently happen. The method of protection against them is simple. Like with high winds, you need to make the building flexible. Let's look at the foundation of such a construction. Good old piles hold the enormous weight of the skyscraper, but the concrete pad of the building itself stands on huge springs. During an earthquake, the ground shakes and moves from side to side, but the springs dampen and compensate for the movement, so the building stays in place. Also, engineers surround buildings in earthquake zones with concrete circles underground. So here's a skyscraper with its foundation. Here's one ring around it, and here's another. When an earthquake hits and the ground starts to shake, these rings dampen the force of the earthquake. And if around the rings it feels like strong waves, inside the perimeter, it's like a calm bay. Another option is to reinforce the building with steel beams. You may have seen these things on bridge piers, but in this case, there are small cylinders on each beam. Each cylinder is filled with oil and has a piston. When the building starts to swing during an earthquake, the piston starts to compress the oil in the cylinder. The oil turns the mechanical energy from the swinging into heat. This dampens the energy released by the earthquake. And sometimes, engineers have to construct a building in a place where there's a lot of water in the soil. If you drill a hole for a pile there and fill it with concrete, the water will wash out the cement or keep it from drying out. In such cases, you have to freeze that water. To do it, builders make a lot of small drill holes at the construction site. Then they put pipes into these holes and create a connected pipe system. There's a similar pipe system in your fridge. It's hidden under the inner paneling. Now, we pump some liquid nitrogen inside. The water gives off its heat to the liquid nitrogen and starts to freeze. Meanwhile, the workers have time to fill the pile holes with concrete. But water in its ice form takes up more space than in liquid form. So when the ice melts, the ground sags a little. So what if you want to build a city on water, like Venice? Then you'll need long piles. The builders of Venice used wooden ones. They had to get to the bottom of the lagoon first. And then they moved a few more dozen feet deeper through the soft clay soil until they reached the hard rock. The builders drove such piles around the perimeter of the future building. And the construction itself was built in such a way that most of its weight rested on the outer walls. If you dive underwater in Venice, you'll see hundreds of thousands of such piles. The task is more difficult if you build a bridge. In addition to a solid foundation, you have to take into account thermal expansion. The rule is simple. When something gets hot, it expands. And when it cools, it shrinks. Look at railroads. There is a gap between each rail. The clatter of the wheels you hear when on a train is born exactly on these gaps. When the sun heats the rails in the summer, they extend. This creates tension inside the metal. Then the rail can bend sideways or even upward like a worm. 
but if engineers have provided such gaps, the metal will expand and fill that space. A bridge is exactly the same as a huge rail, and in hot weather, it can expand too. So engineers leave gaps there on purpose. You can see them on the surface of the bridge. They're usually covered with a sheet of metal that looks like a comb. When the bridge heats up, these combs come together. Miles of land with no clouds in the sky. A little scorpion digs itself underground to escape the heat. No trees or bushes as far as the eye can see. A desert wasn't always like this. Most of them used to be covered with lush green and thick vegetation. Each desert is unique in its own way. It's defined as an area that receives less than 10 inches of rainfall per year. So, with barely any water to support life, the atmosphere is prone to extreme shifts of temperature. That's why a desert can be scorching hot during the day, but the temperatures drop significantly at night. As soon as the sun sets, all the heat disappears, since there's no atmospheric moisture to trap it inside. Jungles and rainforests stay warm at night, since the humidity acts as a net trapping the heat. These drylands are a result of rain shadow. It's part of the weather cycle that creates precipitation. Damp, warm wind blowing from a certain direction hits a mountain and slowly rises up to form clouds. But as it goes higher, it begins to cool, which makes it release moisture. It's technically fog. So, as a result, the other side of the mountain can't retain any humidity. That's how it turns dry and barren. If we look at this on a regional scale, then you'd notice that deserts aren't even located near the mountains. A high-pressure system is when a flow of dry air remains near the surface. They can be found in subtropical or desert places. If the high-pressure system is consistent, then it's not easy for the opposite effect to take place, which causes typical weather patterns. Many deserts aren't even covered in sand. When walking through a desert, you're stepping on millions of years of nature doing its job. When the days are boiling hot and the nights teeth-chattering cold, the rocks tend to break down easily. The dryness and winds cause erosion and contribute to breaking down these rocks, exposing the bedrock underneath. And as time goes on, the rocks get smaller and smaller until the sand is produced. The larger chunks of sand sink to the bottom, while the smaller grain-like pieces remain on top. The wind transfers the sand in multiple directions and on other larger rocks. Over time, the sand constantly rubbing against the rocks will help it erode it until one day that rock will turn into sand. Dunes are the ocean waves of the desert. Sand dunes are unique in that they don't have a consistent shape. One day, you may see a dune sea in front of you, and the next day, it can be gone. Sand almost behaves like water. Try taking some dry sand with one hand and hold a fist. You'll notice the sand leaking out of your control as it spills. Sand is an accumulation of ground-up rocks shaped by the environment, wind, and gravity. Sand dunes can be found wherever there is a large plain of land and wind. So, beaches, deserts, and even abandoned farmlands have them. You can point out certain dunes depending on the vegetation. So, the ones on the beach have different composition and are smaller. But the ones that cover more ground have a flat or rippled surface. In such places, you can find sand sheets that stretch for miles ahead. Sandstorms form closer to the edges of the desert rather than in the middle. With no vegetation to shield and limit the storms, they can get pretty big. The wind starts off slow and then picks up pace, carrying many particles and exposing the ground below. The rest of the particles lying on the ground begin to vibrate. The stronger the wind, the more sand will be in your face. So the particles all bump into each other and carry the rest of them in the air. The sandstorm can be so huge that it blocks out the sun. In 2001, a sandstorm in China moved an estimated 6.5 million tons, covering an area of around 52 million square miles. About 80% of deserts aren't covered with sand, but rather with barren earth. With no plants and rainfall, the sun just bakes the ground as it is and holds everything in place. You can find hills and rock formations in deserts, many of them shaped by erosion. Some deserts have small mountains, too, and depending on the geologic elements, the color and hardness of the rock vary. But not any sandy patch of land is a real desert. The common ones are composed mainly of sand. There are some that are classified as pebble deserts, rock deserts, and even snow and ice ones. Cold deserts are found all over the world. The Gobi Desert, the coastal desert of Peru and northern Chile, have those. 
There is no humidity around these places, so moisture can't be contained to make clouds. The biggest desert in the world is the whole continent of Antarctica. This giant icy wasteland has no rainfall, but dry winds similar to those in hot deserts. Ice and snow cover almost every square inch of the place that's only habitable by scientists and researchers, and a bunch of penguins. In the Sahara Desert, nomadic tribes wander around from place to place. They've been there for thousands of years and only know the desert life. It's estimated that there are only 2.5 million people living there, excluding the Nile Valley. That's one person per square mile. In the past, the Sahara had a lot more people. Evidence of stone artifacts and even art designed on rocks were found in various places. But those places are dried up, uninhabitable areas. Fossils show that the Sahara was once a large network of rivers and lakes, occupied by ancient extinct marine animals. That was millions of years ago. But just around 7,000 years ago, the Sahara was more vibrant with buffaloes, giraffes, elephants, and other animals that are currently found elsewhere in Africa. The people back then used to live near large Saharan lakes and relied on fishing for food. They created settlements around them while defending themselves from animal threats. A lot of those rivers dried up, but many remain as oases. An oasis is an area that has a fresh water source and fertile soil, surrounded by dryness. People of the Sahara grew crops and planted trees for dates around the perimeter to prevent sand from contaminating the water and destroying the crops. Some of the water was brought in through irrigation of larger rivers or natural springs. There were also underground sources of water. The oasis could be as little as only a few date palms around the body of water to an entire city. They were perfect trading routes for merchants and nomads, often dealing dates, olives, figs, and other commodities. The settlers maintained the oasis for generations until now. Despite the oasis, there were still some nomads wandering around. But both settlers and nomads had domesticated livestock. Saharan people are still specialists when it comes to moving around. Many of them are trained blacksmiths or agriculturalists that follow to where they can thrive and prosper. Even though the desert climate and conditions are hostile for living beings, there are plenty of plants and animals that specialize in such conditions. The Attix antelope is a unique creature that's currently endangered. Its coat is unmistakable, and its horns are beautifully designed. Cool desert snakes that slither sideways disguise themselves in the same color as the sand. If the desert was the ocean, then camels would be the boats. Their humps store fat to cool themselves off when it gets too hot. The two-humped camel isn't native to the Middle East or Africa, but Mongolia and northern China. They have two rows of eyelashes for protection and can close and open their nostrils at will. No desert is complete without scorpions. They're extremely common in the Sahara and can grow to the size of your palm. Let's not forget the animals of the frozen deserts. Penguins are common in the Antarctic, as well as the Arctic fox and polar bears. Deserts don't technically grow in size just because sand spreads further. It works when the ecosystem takes over another land by decreasing vegetation and removing the fertile soil. And then you have more desert. Millions of years ago, there were seas and oceans where deserts are today. What if it all comes back? Water instead of sand, where deserts used to be. Life on the planet would change completely. Sand can act like a liquid if a strong enough airflow makes it rise from below. The air reduces friction between sand particles, making more space. The particles begin to move freely, as if they're in a liquid. If a huge vent suddenly opened under the Earth's crust, blowing air from beneath, then perhaps the entire landscape would begin to sink like being in quicksand. Such monuments as the Egyptian pyramids or the Sphinx would sink under the ground. Huge cities built on sand would disappear. The Sahara Desert would resemble one bubbling cauldron. Camel caravans would simply fall down. But don't worry, the animals wouldn't get hurt. Liquid sand is filled with oxygen, so they'd be able to swim in it. But what if sand turned into water instead of just a liquid version of itself? If this happened quickly and unexpectedly, then disasters would occur on all the beaches of the world. Imagine you're sunbathing on an air mattress on a sandy beach of a seaside resort. 
You're wearing sunglasses, the sea waves are tickling your heels, gulls are squawking overhead, and you have iced tea in your hands. A perfect holiday. But then, you feel your mattress moving, a wave hits you, you take off your glasses and find yourself in the middle of the sea. The entire beach has turned into water. It reaches way up to the road where cars drive and houses stand. You help people who were sunbathing nearby to climb on the mattress. You swim to the new shore, head home, turn on the TV, and see this is happening all over the world. Hundreds of thousands of beaches are flooded. Water overflows city streets and houses. People are scared. Some leave their homes, while others take surfboards and ride the waves. And while part of the world is trying to cope with a global flood of sandy shores, a fifth ocean is being formed at the same time. You get on a plane and fly over the largest sandy desert on the planet. The area of the Sahara Desert is 3.5 million square miles. This is almost the area of the entire USA. Billions of tons of sand turned into water in an instant. And all this water starts to spill over. Animals living in the sand, such as jerboa, scorpions, cobras, and many others, disappear from the face of the planet. The nearest countries are devastated by the flood. The new ocean connects to the Mediterranean, Red, and Tyrrhenian seas. The water level in the world's oceans is rising so much that most island countries have to evacuate to continents. In coastal cities, people sit in cafes and enjoy life. Some are sunbathing, while others try to escape from the heat and the shade. Suddenly, the wind rises and a shadow appears on the ground. People look at it, puzzled, and it keeps growing. Everyone looks up and sees that a huge tsunami is approaching the shore. Desert countries have it even worse. They're flooded at once and turn into many small divided islands. And huge waves will hit the shores of port towns for a long time. The hottest places on the planet have become wet. Hot sands turned into almost boiling water. It quickly evaporates and forms huge rain clouds. Thanks to high humidity, the air pressure changes and strong winds begin to blow. They drive clouds all over the planet. Long rains begin all over the world, drenching everything. Water mixes with the world's oceans and cools down. The hottest places in the world are getting colder. With temperatures changing, tornadoes and hurricanes form in different parts of the world and ravage the planet. The face of the whole Earth is warping. New seas, lakes, and rivers form all over the world. Before, water comprised 70% of the planet's surface. Now, it's 90%. Fortunately, cataclysms don't last long. Even though sands cover a lot of land, they're not very thick. The depth of the ocean is hundreds of times deeper than the depth of sand in a desert. In some, the sand is only a few inches thick. Only the largest dunes may reach 150 feet in thickness. The water levels will rise drastically and will probably never return to what they used to be. But at least the weather will calm down sooner or later. But something bad is still going to happen. Every year, 2 billion tons of dust rise into the air. Most of it comes from deserts. Particles of this dust contain useful elements and bacteria. The wind carries them all over the planet. A quarter of this dust comes to rest in seas and oceans. Bacteria and nutrients feed small creatures in the ocean, such as phytoplankton or krill. These creatures, in their turn, are food for small fish and even whales. And the fish are food for predators, as well as for many land animals. So, if sands turn into water, the ocean will lose a lot of its nutrients. The good news is that it won't last long either. Nutrients and bacteria will adapt to the new conditions and will be able to evaporate with water, which condenses into rain clouds. The largest variety of the marine world lives in shallow waters not far from the coast. The desert turned into water gives ideal conditions for new life to develop. New species of animals appear that can survive in hot water. Many creatures that lived in hot sands have now adapted to marine life. Camels have learned to swim, and small reptiles can hold their breath underwater for a long time. Thanks to hot weather and shallowness, a huge amount of seaweed grows on the bottom that can withstand high temperatures. The new ocean now resembles a multicolored garden of marine plants. 
people are also trying to adapt. They build towns on massive wooden structures right on the water and attach them to the bottom with long chains. Fishing has become the main source of food for all humankind. Cars have become obsolete. Everyone wants boats. Famous expensive car brands now design luxury yachts and ships. Also, everyone learns to swim, and every resident of sea cities is an excellent swimmer. All the new water was fresh until it mixed with the sea and gained its saltiness. People have created special filters that turn this water fresh. Global stocks are increasing. There are almost no places left in the world where people don't have enough water. But what if our situation became stranger still, and all the sand on the planet, not only on beaches and in deserts, turned into liquid? All hourglasses in the world would accelerate because the water flows much faster than sand. Sand is also used for all types of construction works. They use it in the production of concrete and to lay a strong foundation. It would be impossible to create bricks and clay without sand. Almost all houses, not counting wooden ones, would simply fall apart. But wooden houses could just rot because of the high humidity levels. Sand is used for glass. Production of mirrors, windows, and light bulbs would be greatly reduced. World reserves of drinking water would decrease as sand is a natural filter for purification. There would be huge traffic jams on the roads because, well, there would be no roads to speak of. Imagine you're driving a car and its wheels turn into jelly. Road vehicles would be severely affected. Planes would also stop flying because sand is used in the construction of the runway. The only means of transportation left would be ships. Sand is present almost everywhere on our planet, so the water would begin to moisten and wash away the soil. The whole world would turn into a vicious marsh, and it would be very difficult to move around. The humidity levels would increase significantly, and thick fogs would appear every day. A huge number of scolopendras, salamanders, frogs, and other creatures that love humidity would take over the planet. Some insects may evolve and increase in size thanks to the new ideal conditions. And people, if they survive at all, might grow scales to better transfer moisture. The Earth would look like a planet from a sci-fi movie. But fortunately, this isn't going to ever happen. Attention! Attention! Residents of all countries and cities of the world! A massive asteroid is approaching the Earth! Now its speed is several times greater than the speed of sound, and each day it accelerates even more. Once it enters our solar system, it will fly past Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars. The gravitational fields of these planets will also accelerate the asteroid, and our planet will be the final destination. A collision is inevitable. According to scientists, a meteorite the size of Mount Everest can destroy the entire planet. The disaster will happen in 350 days. There's panic in the streets. People buy and build bunkers. Scientists and astronomers from all over the world were assembled to find a solution. The only way to avoid the collision is to destroy the space object. Yeah, a powerful rocket can split an asteroid into hundreds of thousands of pieces. In this case, a meteor shower will hit the Earth, but it's better than the complete destruction of our home. In less than a year, people build several powerful rockets. Then, using the best telescopes in the world, astronomers create a unique guidance system. And now, we just have to wait for the asteroid to get into our solar system. All the people start moving to one continent with top-notch bunkers for everyone. The damage from the asteroid is impossible to predict, so it's better to hide people in one super large safe place to wait out the collision. The moment has come. The asteroid passes by Uranus. The speed increases. Now the colossal space object moves only 10 times slower than the speed of light. Scientists launch rockets into the air. The asteroid flies past Saturn and destroys a part of its ring. The asteroid's trajectory is changing. It flies past other planets through a twisting path, picks up speed, and now heads towards the Earth. The rockets leave a long trail of fire behind and reach the speed of sound. They're getting closer to the asteroid. Near Mars, a collision happens. The rockets hit the target. The asteroid explodes and splits into millions of particles. All the pieces fly in different directions. The Earth is saved. At this moment, the Earth's satellites record a huge burst of energy. 
a small part of the asteroid is headed towards Earth. It's tiny, about the size of a grain of sand. But the explosion accelerated it, and now the grain of sand is flying towards the Earth at a speed of 185,000 miles per second, which is 99% of the speed of light. At this speed, the grain has almost the same destructive power that the entire asteroid had. It's approaching the moon. A few more seconds, and the grain of sand will hit our planet. All the people are waiting with bated breath. The grain gets such incredible power because of the laws of physics. The greater the speed any object is, the more mass and energy it has. When the grain of sand reaches a speed close to the speed of light, its energy and mass begin to increase dramatically. You can't even see this tiny grain of sand, but inside, it has the mass of an entire continent. If the grain reaches the speed of light, its mass will be infinite, and then a black hole will appear. In this case, all living and even inanimate things on the planet will disappear. Trees, seas, and oceans, all the cities, countries, and continents, air, sound, atmosphere, any molecule of the Earth, everything will be absorbed by the incredible gravitational force of the black hole. Then, when there is no trace of our planet, the hole will take over the moon. The gravitational force will grow and absorb other planets of the solar system. Soon, it will reach the sun. Our star will split into thousands of strips like spaghetti and will emit a tremendous amount of energy. This could trigger the birth of a second black hole. But fortunately, we only have 99% of the speed of light, which changes everything. Also, no object that has mass can reach the speed of light. The grain of sand enters the Earth's atmosphere. From the outside, it looks like a blinding meteor that pierces the sky. The grain heats up, passing through the layers of the atmosphere. Clouds within a radius of 100 miles around are burning up. The sky becomes crystal clear. If you look at it in slow motion, you can see the air is ionized because the air molecules are split. In nature, this process occurs during lightning flashes. Our sun also has ionizing energy and disinfects the air. The meteorite leaves an ozone hole behind it. So now, this place is not protected from space radiation and ultraviolet light. The grain of sand flies straight into the center of the southern ocean. The closest continent to the explosion is Antarctica. The air around it warms up and mixes with the cold temperature of the ocean, creating hurricanes. As soon as the grain approaches the ocean surface, the water starts boiling. The temperature and energy of the grain are so huge that the water evaporates, but the vapor molecules are instantly burned up. Thousands of gallons of water just disappeared from the face of the Earth. The grain flies down for the first few feet without touching the surface as the water evaporates before it. Then it falls into the ocean and creates a powerful explosion. Hundreds of millions of gallons of water foam and boil because of the hot temperature. The entire ocean within a radius of 100 miles is illuminated with a bright light. The ocean depths, where sunbeams have never been before, are almost as transparent as the water at the bottom of a pool. The wreckage of old sunken ships splits into atoms because of the powerful explosion. Unknown sea monsters and giant squids that live in the dark are afraid of the bright light and swim away. Then, finally, a grain of sand touches the seafloor and penetrates deep into the Earth's crust. If it reaches the Earth's core, the planet will most likely explode from a burst of incredible energy. Fortunately, this is not going to happen. The resistance of the ocean and the ground slows down the grain and takes its energy away. It provokes a slight shift of tectonic plates, and there's more to come. Huge waves form and spread throughout the ocean. The blast wave creates enormous tsunamis. Imagine throwing a small rock into a puddle. The same thing happens to the ocean. Huge waves are approaching the coastal cities. Fortunately, people were evacuated from there, but the damage caused by one grain of sand will cost hundreds of trillions of dollars. Houses are destroyed, roads are flooded. After a while, it starts raining with hurricanes. Ocean water vaporized by the grain forms into huge storm clouds. The wind drives them to the continents. And then, after the tsunami, prolonged rain begins, flooding entire countries. 
Several days later, natural disasters are still here. The temperature of the Southern Ocean has increased by several degrees. The water is boiling at the collision site, melting the Antarctica glaciers. Millions of icebergs are melting away, so the water level of the world's oceans is rising. The edges of some continents go underwater forever. Thunderclouds reach the Sahara and other deserts. The shift of tectonic plates causes earthquakes on some continents. Volcanoes are awakening. The sky is filled with volcanic ash. It will take months for all the ashes to settle. In the beginning, it creates challenging conditions for life on Earth. Plants and all living things don't receive enough sunlight. In trees and seaweed, photosynthesis is disrupted. Oxygen production stops. It's getting harder to breathe. The air that has filled the planet's atmosphere is slowly running out. People have to adapt to new conditions. They build new cities both on the land and in the ocean. They create plantations with artificial lighting for photosynthesis production. Fortunately, all the problems end when the ash settles. Inside the volcanoes, there's hot magma flowing. It may come in handy as it's rich in chemical elements and minerals. Together with the ash, nutrients fall to the ground and the soil is now well fertilized. Plants, trees, fruits, and vegetables grow incredibly fast and produce a lot of new oxygen. The Sahara is filled with blooming flowers now, and it looks more like a meadow with flowers, not a desert. The grain of sand just renewed the planet instead of destroying it. Texas is home to some of the oddest, creepiest, and most unusual animals you've ever heard of. It might come as a surprise, but this state is full of creatures you'll hardly see in other places. So, let's have a look at the most amazing ones. This truly beautiful bright blue creature is called the Blue Sea Dragon. Despite such an imposing name, the critter is actually tiny, usually no bigger than a grape. You may find it on the beach or floating beside you in the water. Now, you need to remember one thing. However pretty this little slug may look, never ever touch it. One tourist spotted a few of these pretty dragons on the shore of Mustang Island. He scooped one of the creatures up. He wanted to film it. Luckily, he put it back into the water before it could sting him. Otherwise, it would have ended badly since the Blue Sea Dragon is venomous. Despite their tiny size, their sting can pack a punch. All because of their diet. Their favorite dish is the Portuguese man o war a jellyfish that has enough venom to paralyze small fish and crustaceans. The blue dragons first use mucus to neutralize the jellyfish's infamous stinging cells. And then they steal these cells from the man o war's tentacles and store and concentrate them within their own tissues. Then they release these stinging cells on contact, which makes their own sting more powerful, even worse than that of the man o war itself. These awesome creatures are also extremely sneaky. Even though their appearance is bright, to say the least, they're well-known masters of disguise. You see that vibrant blue coloring is actually on their bellies. And when they float on their backs, they simply blend with the water. As for their backs, they're gray to camouflage these animals on the seafloor. Now, how about a funny fact? A group of tiny dragons floating together is called a blue fleet. And another fact. Blue dragons normally lay a string of around 16 eggs, and it takes them three days or so to hatch into larvae. Blue sea dragons rarely make it to the shore. They're soft-bodied, so when the animals finally get through the surf zone and are deposited on the shore, they're already broken apart. And still, watch out! Even in this case, the venom in their bodies doesn't dissipate. But of course, blue sea dragons aren't the only unusual animals inhabiting Texas. Have a look at this nightmarish creature. Poisonous, slimy, and kinda immortal. Meet the hammerhead worm. The worst thing? It might be lurking in your garden while you're watching this video. You can easily recognize this worm by its creepy spade-shaped head. It doesn't look like any other invertebrate you've ever seen or any other creature that is. At first, it was only found in East Texas. But later, researchers spotted these spine-chilling creatures in North 
Central and South Texas. Basically everywhere but the arid areas of West Texas. One of the most terrifying things about this worm might be its length. This creature can grow as long as one foot. Luckily, such giants aren't very common. Most hammerhead worms only reach 6 inches in length. You can come across two species of these worms in Texas, and both of them will have a dark stripe down the middle. The larger of these two species munches on earthworms, which is actually a big problem. You might know that earthworms play an important role in keeping the soil rich in minerals and overall healthy. If earthworms disappear, plants in such areas won't be getting the nutrients they need. Even for humans and pets, meeting a hammerhead worm isn't the most pleasant experience either. Hammerheads are the only terrestrial invertebrates that secrete a very dangerous neurotoxin, the same as pufferfish produce. Thanks to the sheer size of the human body, touching a hammerhead worm won't hurt you too much, but it may still cause your hand to start tingling or even go numb. It's much more dangerous for pets. There have been cases when dogs ate hammerheads, which left them feeling sick for the whole day. Interestingly, these worms are native to Southeast Asia. But they must have mastered the art of hitchhiking, since in the early 1900s, they were already found in the U.S. Keep in mind that if you want to get rid of a hammerhead worm, which is the best course of action, the worst thing you can do is chop it with a shovel. The thing is, Flatworms reproduce by ripping themselves in half, so by cutting it, you actually help the populations of the worms, turning one into two. That's the reason why hammerheads are sometimes described as immortal, which is a bit of a stretch since these creatures can't survive in vinegar or salt. Now even though you're safe from the hammerhead worm in West Texas, it doesn't mean you can't come across another dangerous animal, such as the land lobster from hell. These creatures are also known as vinegaroons, and they're not real crustaceans, they're arachnids! Huh? Who would have guessed? Anyway, these eight-legged critters have a really nasty bite, but it's not the worst thing about them. Land lobsters? Brace yourself! Spray vinegar-like 85% acid from their tails! Mostly they do it to protect themselves, but it still sounds like an unfriendly thing to do, right? A land lobster can also pinch a finger that's gotten too close with its heavy mouth parts. At the base of their abdomens, vinegaroons have long whip-like tails. That's why these arachnids are often called whip scorpions, even though they're neither related to scorpions nor have stingers. Summer rains lure these arachnids out of their burrows in search of food and love. Luckily, experts claim that land lobsters aren't poisonous to humans but they're very likely to leave a mark with their large pinchers, which they use to capture insects. Vinegaroons can be considered useful since they eat millipedes, crickets, scorpions, and cockroaches. They hunt by sensing the vibrations of their prey with those long front legs of theirs. Since land lobsters prefer to come out after dark, you aren't likely to see one in the daylight. But if you stumble upon one, check it out. If it's a female, it may be carrying her hatchlings on her back. Now, imagine it's the middle of spring and you're walking among blooming flowers and greenery. Suddenly, you spot something extremely bizarre on the ground. The animal looks cute, fluffy, and soft-looking. The desire to touch it is irresistible. Watch out! The sting of the hairy caterpillar can pack a serious punch. This one is called the pus moth caterpillar, or asp. There are several stinging caterpillar species in Texas. The buck moth caterpillar, spiny oak slug caterpillar, saddleback caterpillar, and eo moth caterpillar. And touching any of them can lead to unpleasant consequences. If you had touched that pretty hairy thing in the park, you'd most likely start feeling a burning sensation and develop an itchy rash. In the worst case scenario, you'd even have to go to the emergency room. The main problem is that people react very differently to caterpillar toxins. Some may develop more severe reactions than others. Plus, how bad the consequences are also depends on the thickness of the skin in the affected area. 
In most cases, the unpleasant sensation and rash go away in a few hours or sometimes days. On the bright side, such caterpillars later turn into moths and butterflies that help pollinate flowers and trees. Getting rid of these critters means doing a massive disservice to the area where you live. Specialists are sure that coming across a stinging caterpillar won't lead to anything bad if you keep in mind the rule of thumb. If a caterpillar looks fuzzy, don't touch it. And the best solution to dealing with such creatures is educating people on what such caterpillars are, what they look like, and why it's dangerous to touch them with unprotected hands. June 29th, 1764 seemed like a regular day in one small picturesque town in Germany, Woldeck. Residents were in church. Little did they know that a powerful storm was about to hit the area. It wasn't just an ordinary storm, it was a strong, swirling tornado getting closer and closer. It was an F2 tornado at the beginning, strong enough to uproot trees like oaks and beaches. But as time went by, it grew and became more powerful. It even picked up two children on its way and threw them into a lake. Something strange happened, too. The water level in the lake rose and then quickly retreated. Leaving the lake behind, the tornado struck a house, tearing off the roof and knocking down the walls. Then the tornado changed direction and headed east-northeast, increasing its intensity to F3 level. That's when something fascinating happened. A possible twin or satellite water spout merged with the tornado along the shore of Lake Luzin. It was like two tornadoes coming together. It got wider and stronger, so it started snapping and uprooting solitary oak trees, flinging them 115 feet into the air. It left behind a barren landscape, removing crops, grass, and even topsoil. Back then, people couldn't even read or write very well, let alone use devices that could predict a tornado. This one was so strong it destroyed houses, barns, and even uprooted trees. Such a terrifying thing to see. But there was something special about the church people were in. It had strong stone walls, so they were safe inside, even though everything outside was getting destroyed. They didn't even realize how lucky they were until later. With winds estimated to be over 300 mm, it was unstoppable. The tornado traveled a distance of 19 miles and stretched to a maximum width of 0.6 miles. A raging storm threw tree branches so high, people believed they ended up in the atmosphere. Another strange thing about this tornado was that it occurred during a dry storm. There was very little rain reported, but the storm still managed to make such a mess. It even produced large hailstones, some as big as 5.9 inches in diameter. Just imagine chunks of ice that large falling from the sky. These hailstones caused significant damage to crops and properties, and everything else that was outside at that time. After the storm passed, one scientist, Gottlob Burchard Gensmer, studied the damage and talked to people who had witnessed the tornado, only to realize this was one of the strongest tornadoes ever recorded in history. It reached F5, the highest rating on what's called the Fujita scale, which measures tornado strength. It took an hour for the madness to stop. Back in 1925, people in Northeast Missouri didn't have an organized tornado warning system either. It took them by surprise when one day, in the early afternoon, they saw a tornado forming in that area. At first, it was a small one that briefly lifted off the ground. But as time went by, it started growing into a massive monster. Meanwhile, in West Frankfort, Illinois, some miners were working deep underground, about 500 feet below the surface. Suddenly, the power went out, and they knew something was wrong. They quickly started climbing up the shaft to get to the surface. When they finally made it, they were in for a terrible shock because of the devastating consequences of this giant tornado. The tornado didn't even stop there. It kept on making a mess as it traveled a long distance. It plowed through the land for a whopping 219 miles, all the way from near Redford, Missouri to the east of Princeton, Indiana. It moved at a crazy speed of 73 miles an hour. In one town, Murfreesboro, Illinois, the tornado wiped out a staggering 100 blocks of the town, plus another 70 blocks ended up destroyed by fire. In another town, Griffin, Indiana, not a single building was left standing. The tornado got weaker only at 4.30 in the afternoon. This tornado, known as the Tri-State Tornado, really made history as the worst and longest-lasting tornado ever recorded in the United States. 
In April 1965, people in the region of the Great Lakes started complaining about this weird heat. The forecast showed no storms for that area. It was because of thunderstorms sweeping across the upper Midwest of the United States. These storms were insane and so powerful they created 51 tornadoes in just 12 hours. The states of Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan ended up being hit particularly hard. Something unfortunate happened during this time. All this caught the forecast team, the National Severe Storms Forecast Center, in Kansas City, Missouri, off guard. They quickly tried to send out warnings to let people know what was happening. But many people didn't hear the announcements because there were no outdoor tornado sirens at that time. Additionally, a lot of TV and radio stations didn't regularly broadcast weather alerts. Power was gone, and telephone lines didn't work, which meant many towns were completely cut off from communications. People couldn't receive the warnings because they didn't have access to electricity or working phones. One spring day in 1974, was especially hard because of severe thunderstorms that unleashed a series of powerful tornadoes across 13 states in the United States. These tornadoes lasted for 16 hours, and they ranged from weaker F-0 to the most powerful and destructive F-5 ones. At one terrifying moment, there were 15 tornadoes touching the ground at the same time. One lasted for more than two hours, and two others were swirling around each other like dancers. This was another big lesson, after which some changes in tornado warnings were made. In those days, weather forecasters could only warn people about a tornado if they had seen one with their own eyes, which was mostly too late. April 26, 1989, at around 6.30 in the afternoon, the sky above one district, Maniganj in Bangladesh, turned dark and ominous. The tornado began its journey from one point, Dalatpur, and moved swiftly eastward, Saturia Maniganj Sadar. People living in that region had already been facing a severe drought, and little did they know there were even worse scenarios coming. The storm was fierce, stretching about 10 miles long and 1 mile wide. It covered a relatively small area, but it still caused enormous damage. It tore through the land and blew away buildings, thousands of trees, strong and rooted for years, and everything else in its path. The countryside of Marsala in western Sicily is really beautiful. But it wasn't so stunning on December 8th, 1851. Two fierce tornadoes suddenly swept across the land, leaving nothing but chaos. As they moved, they brought along heavy rain and hailstorms, causing even more damage to the already vulnerable farmlands. One town, Castellamare, had an amazing harbor with plenty of ships, and it suffered great damage. The news of this devastating event reached far and wide, even making its way to the illustrated London news. The outbreak in Oklahoma from 24 years ago, May 3, 1999, was tough too. Just one stormy day caused enormous damage from Texas all the way up to South Dakota. At least 45 tornadoes touched down and Oklahoma was hit the hardest with an F5 tornado. The story seemed familiar. What first seemed like a small twister quickly grew into a massive force that, at one point, measured one mile in width. This one ripped asphalt from roads, peeling it away in layers like fragile paper. It tore the vegetation away and even wrapped roofing materials around power lines. NASA scientists studied the area using satellites. They realized it would take between 10 to 20 years for the vegetation to fully regrow in the region where the tornado left nothing but muddy, barren land. Oklahoma is in a pretty unfortunate spot when it comes to tornadoes. Take 1,947 as an example. The Woodward tornado got named after the city it had struck. This monstrous tornado was massive. It reached 1.8 miles in width, and it raced forward at an incredible speed of around 50 mpic. Before reaching Woodward, the tornado had already caused a lot of mess in other towns along its path. But it was in Woodward where it unleashed its worst fury. Without any warning, it struck the city at 8.42 in the evening, catching the residents by surprise. Communication with the outside world was cut off, leaving families uncertain about the fate of their loved ones. As if one tornado isn't enough, some areas get struck by a series of them. In 1908, an outbreak of tornadoes swept across the eastern part of the United States. From Texas to Georgia and then northward from Oklahoma to Tennessee, at least 34 tornadoes touched down. Nature showed no mercy. 
buildings were torn apart, and once thriving streets were reduced to rubble. The Fujita scale measures tornado strength based on two things, the speed of the winds and the amount of destruction caused. F5 tornadoes are the strongest, most destructive ones. I mean, some people talk about F6 tornado with winds that could blow at over 300 miles per hour. If this one was passing by, you'd definitely know how Dorothy felt. Luckily, F6 exists only in stories, and Oz is the last place you are likely to end up at. Now, dinosaurs ruled our planet for over 165 million years, and some walk on our planet even today. Well, at least some of their descendants. Our modern birds evolved from what used to be a scary group of meat-eating dinosaurs we know as theropods. It all started during the Mesozoic era, about 250 million years ago, when a group of creatures called dinosomorphs roamed Earth. They didn't look like those dinos that might have come to your mind, like Brontosaurus or T-Rex, but that's the group dinosaurs evolved from. These creatures walked on all fours and were as big as house cats. They didn't look as friendly, though, considering they were more like weird lizards with long, thin limbs. As you'd expect, this group wasn't exactly at the top of the food chain, but they were really fast and agile, which helped them survive. Over time, they adapted and started walking upright, so their legs were under their bodies instead of out to their sides. And over time, dinosaur morphs started growing long tails and bigger leg muscles. Their necks became stronger to support the new position they were in, and they even got extra hip bones that helped them move faster and more efficiently. That's when dinosaurs came on the scene, somewhere between 240 and 230 million years ago. Their name comes from the word dinosauria, which means terrible lizard. The oldest dinosaur fossils belong to these fellows that lived in Argentina. This one is even older, but we're still not sure if it's a real dinosaur or its relative, dinosaur morph. Now, considering the size of their ancestors, dinosaurs weren't large at the beginning, more like dogs or horses. There weren't many species back then, so if you could go back to that time, you'd see a bunch of reptiles walking around on two legs. But as time went by, they adjusted to different environments, and we got more interesting groups. For example, small and fast predators, like this guy. They all fall into the category of archosaurs, a group that also includes pterosaurs. Yup, their name may not imply it, but these are not dinosaurs. As some dinosaur morphs evolved into dinosaurs, they got certain advantages, like arms. They could do much more thanks to that. Some could catch prey using their hands, others could grasp branches. Now, the freedom they got by moving their arms later helped some of them evolve into birds and start flying. Dinosaurs were probably warm-blooded. It means they could stay active all the time. They didn't depend on the conditions around them like, for example, reptiles do. The latter are cold-blooded, and they have to rely on their surroundings to regulate their body temperature. Dinosaurs didn't rule the animal kingdom for the first tens of millions of years of their existence, either. Crocs were at the top of the food chain back then, then the Jurassic period hit, and new kinds of dinosaurs showed up, like those giant plant-eating dinosaurs. For example, seropods. You know them. Dinos with long tails and necks that could eat plants at different heights, such as Brachiosaurus. Allosaurus is another famous dino from that time you will probably recognize. Spikes on the tail, bony plates on the back, you know, good old Stegosaurus. The Jurassic period was that time when dinosaurs started to get bigger and bigger. Then the Cretaceous period came along, and finally, these magnificent beasts reached the peak of their fame. That was the time when the mighty T-Rex took the throne and got to the top of the food chain. T-Rex probably lived around 28 years, but it reached adult size really fast. Now, it wasn't easy to survive back then. T-Rex falls into the category of tyrannosaurs, and scientists have found out those fellas were fierce even when they were at a pretty young age. They discovered a fossil of a teenage tyrannosaur that was 75 million years old, and it had two baby dinosaurs inside its stomach. Mm. They realized that when tyrannosaurs were at a young age, they went for small dinosaurs, such as these guys, their dino cousins. 
As they grew older, they started taking on bigger challenges, like those peaceful giant dinosaurs that like to hang out with their group and eat plants. But large predators weren't the only ones that would have made you shiver with fear. That was also the time when fast and smart creatures called Velociraptors show up. They weren't some scaly dinosaurs that would catch their prey using those claws in the shape of sickles, like shown in the movies. Their bodies were covered in feathers, and they would grow up to 100 pounds, which is about the size of a wolf. And to bust one more myth, they didn't hunt in packs. Velociraptors probably preferred to hunt solo and use their claws not to slash their prey, but to clutch it. T-Rex and Velociraptor fall into the group called theropods. We mentioned them at the beginning, the creatures today's birds evolved from. But even though Velociraptors were covered with feathers, they still couldn't fly. Their wishbones weren't shaped in a way to support flying, and their arms were too short. Maybe it was better that way because during the Cretaceous period, flying dinosaurs called pterodons were the ones that took over the skies. Things had been going really great for dinosaurs until one unfortunate day 66 million years ago when an asteroid hit our planet. It's not that the asteroid itself erased all the dinosaurs right away, but it caused changes in the environment, which made it way harder to survive. At that time, about 75% of animals living on our planet went extinct. The asteroid was really big. When it hit Earth, it created a giant crater in the Yucatan Peninsula and sent a lot of debris into the atmosphere, which blocked the sun right away. For months, dense clouds of dust blocked sunlight. Our home planet was darker and colder than before, which wasn't good for plants. Creatures that ate plants couldn't survive those changes either. So it all turned into a chain reaction when most of the ecosystem collapsed. When the dust finally cleared, all those greenhouse gases that had formed after the impact made temperatures go way higher than they had been in a really short period of time. All land animals that weighed more than 55 pounds were gone. But not everything disappeared. There were fewer plants, but they were less affected than animals. All because their pollen and seeds can survive really messed up conditions for a longer time. So what we have today is basically the seeds we were left with back then. After the asteroid hit, flowering plants dominated our planet. All non-bird dinosaurs went extinct too. Some species survived as birds. At first, those brave survivors were small. But later, birds evolved to bigger sizes. Now, there's a study that says that if the asteroid had slammed into some other spot on Earth, the fate of many creatures and plants would have been very different. If the rock had fallen maybe a couple of minutes later, it would have hit deeper waters. Less rock would have vaporized and risen to block out the warmth and light coming from the sun. In that scenario, we'd probably still have dinosaurs around. For example, Triceratops was one of the last dinos that had nothing in common with birds. If the asteroid had missed our planet, we would see some of them still roaming around. But since evolution never rests, maybe in a little bit different form. Hundreds of dinosaur species roamed our planet, and researchers give a name to a new type approximately every two weeks. It's not fair to stick to T-Rex, Stegosaurus, Spinosaurus, and other famous sauruses all the time. They've had their chance to shine in the movies and across the internet. So let's check out dinosaurs that no one talks about. First on our list is Taurosaurus. The special thing about this dinosaur is that it definitely had one of the largest skulls ever found. It was big because of this frill going from the back of the animal's skull and covering its neck. The frill wasn't there for protection. It was probably just to show off a bit. The bone in the frill was thin and full of holes. As you can see, it's very similar to Triceratops. There are still debates about whether these two are the same species. But more and more studies show that they were more like cousins. They were probably similar in size, but Taurosaurus had a longer head with big openings, as well as longer frill bones with a groove on top. It also had more pairs of horns on the back of the frill. Some like to call Taurosaurus a bull lizard. These fellows were plant eaters that may have lived in social groups. 
They existed at approximately the same age, but Taurosaurus somehow ended up on the less popular side of the family. Kentrosaurus was a small stegosaurus. It's one of the least cuddly dinosaurs of all time. Its long, thin spikes seemed to be a pretty good defense mechanism. Stegosaurus, on the other hand, had shorter, thicker spikes that were less likely to bend or snap when the animal used them. Now, you wouldn't want to get anywhere near Kentrosaurus, though. Its tail could swing in a big half-circle and hit with a force strong enough to break a human skull. Any volunteers? No? Okay. One scientist used scans of the dino's fossils to make a computer model of its skeleton. The model showed that Kentrosaurus had a flexible neck. It must have been really useful for looking around to see if something interesting was going on or if there was any dangerous animals trying to sneak up. Kentrosaurus typically walked on all four legs with straight hind limbs. The computer model tells us it could spread its front legs out to its sides, too. Maybe it was a way to protect its belly during fights. Stegosauruses, in general, had tails that were like big weights at the back of their bodies. That's why their balance point was closer to their hips. That's also the reason why they could easily stand on their hind legs and swing their tails around. So most people haven't heard of heterodontosaurs, even though their fossils show that dinosaurs got feathers way back before we thought and in groups where we didn't expect it. In 2008, paleontologists identified the first known skull of a baby heterodontosaurus, which was less than 2 inches long, smaller than a tea bag. This baby dinosaur had relatively big eyes and a short snout compared to bigger ones of its kind. Now, what's really interesting is that some scientists used to think that heterodontosaurus's tusks, like those of modern warthogs, only appeared when they were fully grown. But it seems they had them from the early stages of their life. Heterodontosaurus had five fingers on each hand, two of which were opposable. It was a good tool, considering the animal probably ate both plants and meat. Humans have different types of teeth, some for biting, some for chewing, and also canines. But most reptiles have just one kind of teeth. Hydrodontosaurus was special because it had three different types of teeth. Small peg-like ones, big teeth resembling canines, and square-shaped teeth that did the cutting job. Scientists are not entirely sure how this creature used these different types of teeth. Maybe it was for digging up roots, breaking into termite nests, or even defending themselves against dangerous animals. Okay, say this name with me now. Sidacosaurus. She was quite a common dinosaur in its time, but she never still gained popularity. Scientists found out that when these dinosaurs were young, they probably crawled, considering they had longer arms and short legs. But as they got older, between 4 and 6 years old, their hind legs started growing much faster and became much longer than their front legs. So, later in life, they likely didn't move on all fours anymore, but walked on two legs. Inside the stomach of one of these creatures, scientists found pebbles. This shows the animals either had a hard time digesting what it ate, or it didn't chew its food very well. Its beak looks quite familiar. That's how it got its specific name, a parrot lizard. It was really strong, and some believe the creature used it to crack and open tough nuts and seeds before the pebbles in its stomach helped mash them up for digestion. These guys might have been good at swimming. They had broad feet, and the shape of their tail could have helped them move in the water relatively easily. Some scientists even believe they might have spent most of their lives swimming in rivers and lakes. In 2004, researchers found something really sweet. 24 young parrot lizards huddled together. They were too big to be hatchlings, so it could be a bunch of teenagers who had left their nests and then formed a group where they could support one another and defend themselves better. But apparently, that plan didn't work out so well. Now, check this one out. Stygimolog, or as they call it, Styx demon. We're looking at a peaceful, plant-eating creature with bony spikes and knobs on its skull. 
Most scientists believe it was a younger form of this fellow, even though they used to think they were a separate species. Stygimoloch is smaller than its more popular cousin, but it's also more robust and has a pretty thick neck. This dinosaur, with small forelimbs and long hind legs 3 feet high, which is half as high as an average human. That doesn't sound dangerous in the world of giant and fierce dinosaurs, but the animal had a very thick skull roof. Maybe it wasn't the strongest tool to defend itself, but it probably helped in combat with rivals from its own species. They most likely headbutted to win the hearts of their chosen ones. But rivals from its own herd were a piece of cake compared to the predators that might have gone after it. After all, this dino lived at the same time as old T-Rex. Now, when someone tells you to picture a dinosaur, Chisosaurus would probably be the last thing coming to your mind. It looks as if you've put together pieces of random animals and tried to make your friends believe this truly was a real animal that once roamed the Earth. But it's actually a dino, with giant sharp claws on its forelimbs, a bulky body, and a long neck ending with a tiny head. Now, don't let the claws scare you, though. These creatures didn't go after other animals since they were herbivores. But these claws could protect the animal from intruders and predators. The full scientific name of this creature describes it as a giant sloth-like reptile from China. This animal was one of the biggest and oldest members of the group where it belonged, which lived around 115 million years ago. No, I wasn't around then. At first, it was hard to tell which animals were related to this weird-looking dinosaur. But in the 1990s, scientists made a conclusion that they were modified plant-eating theropods, which is similar to carnivorous dinos. They also most likely had feathers and small wings, like some sort of a very big turkey. <laughs> it was hot in the tropics, a type of heat unknown to the men aboard the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria ships, led by Italian explorer Christopher Columbus. It had been months since these men left their home cities in Europe, and until then, Europe was all they knew. They were given a difficult and even dangerous task. Spain hired Columbus to find a new western route to Asia. They needed new routes for trading and buying spices, but it was far from a simple job. I mean, crossing the ocean never is. Little did those sailors know that their lives were about to change forever. Land in sight! Someone must have shouted on board. But when they finally stepped on that new foreign land, they discovered they were not in Asia. They had landed in the Americas. You've probably heard this tale before. Historically speaking, Columbus arrived in the Americas in 1492. But what would have happened if Columbus's ship had faced a lethal storm in the Atlantic Ocean and had never made it to the new land? What would today's history look like? First things first, nobody discovered anything. When we say that the Americas were discovered, we're kind of ignoring the millions of people who already lived there. You see, the Americas were only discovered from Europe's point of view. Columbus would only have discovered something if when he got there, he was faced with acres and acres of empty land. But that was not the case at all. Second, Columbus was not the first explorer to land in the Americas. Believe it or not, the Vikings approached American shores in the 10th century. Their expeditions have been well documented and accepted by scholars. Here's what might have happened. Around the year 1000 CE, Viking explorer Leif Erikson sailed to a place called Vinland. Cute name, huh? It's now a region in Canada called Newfoundland. But his crew didn't stay too long. They arrived to find 10 Native Americans napping under their overturned canoes. They attempted some trade, but I'm guessing the Vikings weren't too friendly and the Americans didn't really like them. The Vikings' account of the encounter shows they felt outnumbered and menaced, so they sailed away back to their land. That makes sense, right? As I said earlier, there were millions of people living in the ginormous continent of the Americas. Any foreigner would be outnumbered there. Now take a look at what North America looked like before our buddy Chris got there. 
it was not divided into the normal states we're used to. And if Columbus had never arrived, the United States would probably never have been united to begin with. After all, there were hundreds of first Americans living in these lands, and they lived amongst their own tribes, quite different from the Europeans. It's not accurate to think that there were no political systems going on in the Americas before Europeans arrived. We just need to understand that they were different from what we're used to today. When Europeans arrived, they imported their belief systems with them, from religious beliefs and language systems to things as simple as clothing habits. If the Americas had developed on their own, maybe their sense of fashion would be completely different today. You see, Europeans had a developed sense of fashion by the time they arrived in the West. They wore things such as this and this. But those don't really work in the tropics, do they? For them, fashion had to do with showing a certain economic status, while in the Americas, that didn't exist. For Native Americans, clothing was mainly functional and related to the weather. In warmer climates, Native people would wear short-like cloths to cover their intimate parts. They would walk bare-chested and use shoes known as moccasins. Yes, similar to the moccasins you probably own. In colder climates, they would resort to using leather and fur parkas. Of course, there was always the special clothing used for ceremonial purposes. So I'm guessing that if Columbus never reached the Americas, brands such as the Gap, Hollister, and Forever 21 would have never existed. But we could live with that, couldn't we? Here's a wild thought. Let's say that by the 1700s, Native Americans had developed complex engineering skills. They built big boats, maybe a bit smaller in size than the traditional European ships, and decided to venture across the ocean. Let's say they were the ones who arrived on European shores, in places such as Spain and Portugal. They carried gifts and goods with them for trading, of course. This was also a common practice amongst them back home, known as potlatch. Sure, they were received with suspicion by the Europeans, who had only ever traded with Asia. But with this inverted encounter, a different type of relationship began between Native Americans and Europeans. Since Europeans didn't claim ownership of the Americas, the people from the so-called New Land weren't considered inferior to them. Actually, they stood side by side as equals, each one with their own power and set of knowledge. Native Americans taught Europeans a new type of ruling system, a more decentralized one. So modern-day structures of government would look really different. Maybe Europeans decided that four years was a long time for someone to hold decision power, so they implemented smaller and more frequent elections. Oh, and the landscape of European cities also changed a lot. Instead of huge statues made of copper and bronze showing men and ships on their way to the Americas, the Europeans built totem poles in honor of their alliances with first Americans. In terms of medical and medicinal knowledge, they had a lot to exchange about. While Europeans were making advances in traditional medicine, Americans had developed an impressive knowledge of herbs that could heal a series of things. Before they knew it, Europeans were selling different varieties of plants in their pharmaceutical establishments. They had one big barrier though, language. Since Europeans never arrived on American shores, they also never taught their language to Americans. So maybe in this scenario, both cultures brought in their best linguists and tried creating a new language from scratch. Something that could be comprehensible from both perspectives and that could encompass both of their worldviews. The implications of this on modern day life would be really profound if you stop to think about it. Let's say that this newly created language involved some symbols and drawings in it. You see, Native Americans often told stories using symbols known as pictograms. They were quite literal sometimes. As you can see, a mountain was represented by, well, a mountain. It's crazy to think that this system of communication has been around for 5,000 years since it was actually invented by the Sumerians. And hey, maybe even our laptop keyboards would come equipped with these symbols, and you could write more visually hybrid and fun emails than the ones you write today. The American landscape would have also changed. You see, if neither Columbus nor any of the other European dudes that went after him reached the so-called new land, Central and Latin American cities would look completely different than they do today. 
Maybe the bustling empires of the time, such as the Inca, the Maya, and the Aztec, would have grown immensely. To be fair, they were already pretty big by the time Europeans got there. Some pre-Columbian Maya cities were as big as medieval London and Paris in terms of population. But oh my, the Mayan Empire would have grown so much that it could have spread out all over of Central America. They could have developed their pyramid building craft up to the point that they managed to build an even larger pyramid than the Giza Pyramid in Egypt. So tourists would come from all over the world to visit. Ah, and in South America? Let's just say the region could have turned into a huge forest, bigger than the Amazon. The Inca could have spread through the Andes and then into the mainland. Places such as Brazil and Argentina never existed. But in their place, there would have been dreamy tropical settlements, which would have become a worldwide reference in sustainable living. Imagine sitting at home, drinking coffee, and watching a new episode of your favorite series, and suddenly, boom, crash, what's happened? Nothing terrible, just a meteorite that has just crashed into your kitchen after breaking the roof. You might think this story is entirely made up, but that's what actually happened in New Jersey during the Ida Aquarid meteor shower, which is active from April 19th to May 28th and peaking on May 5th through 6th. The space rock itself was the size of a pork roll sandwich. It was also pitch black and weighed almost four pounds. It slammed through the roof and hit the wooden floor, ruining it. When the inhabitants of the house found the rock and touched it, it was still warm. Luckily, the thing wasn't radioactive and there was no one at home at the time this intruder arrived. But the most shocking thing about this meteorite? Astronomers believe it might have come from a cosmic snowball traveling far, far away from Earth. To explain this, I'll have to tell you a bit more about the Eta Aquarid. This meteor shower is famous for its fast meteors, leaving long, glowing trails. It's produced by Comet Halley, completing its orbit around the Sun every 76 years. The comet hasn't visited Earth since 1986 and won't come back until 2061. Right now, it's somewhere near the constellation of Hydra, which is more than 100 light years away from our planet. Every year, Earth has to pass through trails of debris left by the comet. They collide with our atmosphere, disintegrate, and create beautiful, colorful streaks in the night sky. And it happens every time Halley returns to the inner solar system. Its nucleus sheds a layer of ice and rock into space, and some of it reaches our planet. The central New Jersey authorities believe the meteorite that sneaked into the house originated from that meteor shower. But I feel that you might be pondering another question that confuses many people. What's the difference between all those space bodies? I mean, there are so many of them flying out there. Meteors, meteorites, asteroids, comets, ugh. Okay, let's figure it out together. An asteroid is a rocky body orbiting the sun. It's usually not very big and quite inactive. Comets are different. They're covered with ice that normally evaporates in sunlight, forming a coma, which is what a comet's atmosphere is called. This coma consists of dust and gas. A comet also has a tail that is made of dust and or gas too. A meteoroid is a small part of a comet or asteroid that orbits the sun. If this meteoroid manages to sneak into Earth's atmosphere and vaporize there, it's a meteor. It's often called a shooting star. And finally, if a meteoroid manages to survive the passage through our planet's atmosphere and lands on Earth's surface, it becomes a meteorite. If you think such space guests are a rare occurrence, that's not exactly true. Every day our planet is hit with more than 100 tons of sand-sized particles. About once a year, a large car-sized asteroid enters Earth's atmosphere, turns into an impressive fireball and burns, luckily, before reaching the surface of the planet. And every 2,000 years or so, a meteoroid the size of a soccer field hits Earth, causing a lot of damage. And now, imagine this, a huge, really ginormous asteroid is approaching our planet. There's no one on Earth to predict its appearance. Neither is there anyone to stop it. That's why soon, the asteroid crashes into the surface of Earth. The force of the collision is so powerful that the space visitor doesn't stop until it gets through the crust to a depth of several miles. The impact leaves a crater of more than 100 miles across. Thousands of cubic miles of solid rock instantly turn into vapor. The crash sets off a series of natural disasters that erase 75% of life on Earth. The creatures that were close enough to see the crash don't survive for longer than a few seconds. 
Even closer to the impact crater, the ground is covered with thousands of feet of hot ash, grit, and rubble. Several seconds later, everything for many miles around bursts into flames. What doesn't burn down within the next several minutes after the collision faces a different, even more terrifying fate. The asteroid causes a monstrous, largest ever tsunami. A recent study claims that it was thousands of times more powerful than any wave people have ever seen. The tsunami was so devastating, it eroded seafloor sediments half a world away. The team of scientists even remodeled the events of the first 10 minutes after the impact, and the model showed that the asteroid had produced waves up to 30,000 times greater than one of the largest tsunamis people have ever recorded, the one in the Indian Ocean in 2004. You've probably already guessed that I'm talking about a real-life event, namely the asteroid collision that wiped dinosaurs off the face of the Earth. The Chicxulub asteroid, as we now know it, is believed to come from the outer reaches of the solar system. This space body was at least six miles across. It crashed into the shallow seawaters near the Yucatan Peninsula. The impact was so powerful that it left its signature on the face of the planet. In 2021, researchers found out that the collision had carved mega ripples into Earth's crust in the region of modern-day central Louisiana. But such devastating events, when an object that large threatens Earth's inhabitants, happen very rarely once every few million years. Space rocks smaller than 80 feet usually burn up in the atmosphere of our planet, causing little to no damage. If a rocky meteoroid larger than 80 feet but smaller than half a mile across was to hit Earth, it would cause local damage to the impact area. As for a space rock with a diameter larger than half a mile, it'd likely have worldwide effects. And these space bodies aren't even the largest. For comparison, asteroids populating the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter can be as huge as 580 miles across. But you can breathe out. They're too far away and don't pose any threat to our planet. All the time, our scientists keep learning more and more about hazardous asteroids and comets. They have even established a Planetary Defense Coordination Office, aka PDCO. It ensures that potentially hazardous objects get detected as early as possible. An object is considered potentially hazardous if its orbit is predicted to bring it within 5 million miles of Earth. It should also be large enough to reach the surface of our planet over 100 feet across. Interestingly, a meteorite impact isn't the worst thing you need to worry about. Some scientists warn that the most dangerous thing is the shock wave produced by a meteor breaking apart in the atmosphere. For example, one meteor, which originally was an asteroid the size of a six-story building, entered our planet's atmosphere in February 2013 and broke apart 15 miles above the ground. This generated a shockwave that was equivalent to a ginormous explosion. An even larger space visitor was called the Tunguska meteorite. It was also 10 times more energetic. It broke into pieces over the Tunguska River in June 1908, flattening 500,000 acres of forest. If the meteorite hadn't been so huge, this event would have gone undetected because of the remote location where it all happened. So it's a good thing that 90 to 95% of meteors don't survive the fall through our planet's atmosphere. Only those that are made of stronger materials make it so far. Most meteorites, though, are thought to come from comets, which are way more fragile than asteroids. We should also consider the speed of a meteor. If one is approaching Earth at a slower speed, it's more likely to survive the collision with the atmosphere of our planet. It means that the meteor won't burn completely, and some of its remains will reach the ground. Imagine a planet where every breath you take electrifies your body like a shot of espresso. The sky above you is an intense shade of blue, while colossal trees stretch towards the heavens, their vibrant green leaves growing at an astonishing rate. Daily exercise becomes a thrill like no other. With the abundance of oxygen, you become a supercharged version of yourself. Running feels effortless as you dart across the landscape, lifting weights that would normally seem impossible. It's as if the world itself is infused with a surge of energy. Everything is moving faster. The wildlife surrounding you is equally affected by this oxygen overload. Animals roam the land in majestic proportions. Their massive frames are propelled by speed and agility. Picture yourself in a pulse-pounding chase with an oxygen-charged cheetah, racing against a predator that could put a Ferrari to shame. Now you may wonder how such a wild scenario could ever be possible. Well, let's see. 
Oxygen is the powerful fuel that keeps life going. It makes up about 21% of the air we breathe, and every breath we take delivers these tiny molecules to our cells, giving them the energy they need to thrive. Without oxygen, our cells would struggle, and our bodies would fall apart. But that's not all. Oxygen is a superstar that works for all kinds of living things, from tiny bacteria to giant elephants. It's even important underwater, where it enriches the oceans. Amazing creatures like plankton and algae produce lots of oxygen, creating a thriving underwater world. But to fully understand the impact of high oxygen levels on the planet, prepare for a journey back in time. Recently, scientists have made an astonishing discovery. They tested rocks from two different places that were really far apart. And can you believe it? These rocks held tiny pockets of gas that showed how oxygen levels shot up by almost a third in a very short time. It was like a breath of fresh air. So they studied these rocks and found that oxygen levels back then were much higher. Imagine lush landscapes, towering forests, and gigantic swamps that stretched as far as you could see. During the Carboniferous period, oxygen ruled the atmosphere at an impressive 20%, just like today. But over the next 50 million years, its levels shot up to a crazy 35%. Can you imagine what that did? As oxygen surged, something incredible happened. Huge forests grew all over the land, creating a breathtaking green world. And massive swamps took over low-lying areas, making the landscape look surreal and otherworldly. At the same time, carbon dioxide levels dropped. Normally, when things break down, microbes release carbon dioxide into the air. This gas acts like a warm blanket, trapping the sun's heat and raising temperatures. But in the mysterious swamps where these giant plants were buried, the microbes couldn't do their job. The result? The planet got really cold. Who would have thought that a breath of fresh air could have such power? The scientists are still trying to figure out why this happened. But one thing is certain, it wasn't just happening in one place. It was a worldwide phenomenon. It was like the planet was playing a funny game with the climate. But let's go even earlier. We see the first North American dinosaurs making their grand entrance. High oxygen levels are what gave a big boost to the rise of mighty dinosaurs in North America and beyond. Picture tropics filled with the magnificent giant creatures. Obviously, dinosaurs didn't just appear out of nowhere. They took advantage of a changing environment that was perfect for their evolution. Oxygen levels played a huge part in this dinosaur party. As oxygen levels rose, so did the size of these incredible creatures. They started small with predators like Chindosaurus, and soon after, huge dinosaurs like sauropods took over the land. Then, 65 million years ago, dinosaurs disappeared and mammals took over. And here's the interesting part. Mammals never grew as big as dinosaurs. So what's the explanation for this? Mammals, and humans are mammals too, by the way, are special because we can regulate our body temperature. But that comes at a cost. We need a lot of energy to stay warm compared to reptiles and dinosaurs. Dinosaurs didn't bother with temperature control, so they could focus on growing big. The biggest dinosaurs were 10 times larger than the largest mammals. It's like a game of anything you can do, I can do 10 times bigger. Dinosaurs might have had similar limitations with their sizes, but those were much less strict. Before the dinosaurs' extinction, mammals were very small. Many mammal species disappeared along with the dinosaurs. But survivors took advantage of the open ecosystem and rapidly diversified into various body sizes. However, after 42 million years of growth, mammals reached a size plateau. This happened on all continents, most likely because of the temperature and land area. Colder environments allowed mammals to grow larger. Balancing body size and heat became challenging. Land area also played a role in sustaining big populations. But making animals bigger isn't the only thing high oxygen can do. This humble gas is a true jack of all trades. It also acts as our loyal bodyguard, protecting us from harmful UV rays and other dangers from space. Without oxygen, we would be defenseless against space threats. Oxygen also has a fascinating role in shaping the weather. It teams up with its other atmospheric buddies to make the sky go wild with tornadoes, hurricanes, and thunderstorms. They mix and mingle in the air, creating just the right conditions for these exciting weather adventures to happen. 
And these adventures can be dangerous, but they serve an important purpose. They help distribute nutrients and organic matter, carrying soil, leaves, and debris to new places. So what if we decided to mess with nature and crank up the oxygen levels to crazy heights, 30%, 40%, or even 50%? Well, too much of a good thing can become dangerous. Oxygen toxicity is when too much of this gas causes big problems. It's like eating loads of candy. It's fun at first, but soon enough you'll regret it. Surprisingly, an overdose of oxygen can leave you struggling for breath, like a tired dancer in desperate need of a break. At first you might feel a burst of energy, but it doesn't last. Dizziness sets in, as if you've been spinning on the dance floor for hours without stopping. In extreme cases, too much oxygen can even harm your body, making you feel like you've crashed into a huge truck. So, while oxygen is always with us, giving us life, it's important to appreciate its delicate balance. Don't put on your special breathing gear. Also, we wouldn't be the only creatures to suffer from this oxygen extravaganza. Mammals, for example, will struggle to adapt to these extreme levels. The balance of power among species will change drastically, and winners and losers will fight for survival in a world that's spinning out of control. And we'll need stronger shelters to deal with these gigantic animals. We'll have to stay nimble and avoid danger. Amidst all the chaos, there will be astonishing adaptations. Birds will fly higher than ever before, reaching heights that would amaze even the clouds. Also, get ready for more natural disasters and delicate ecosystems hanging in the balance. Fires will start quickly and rage fiercely, making wildfires a constant threat. Even a small spark from a campfire could cause disaster. We'll need to rethink our cooking and heating methods to stay safe in this oxygen-filled world. But let's not forget the other side of the oxygen story. If we had a planet with low oxygen, only around 15%, we would face a completely different struggle. Every breath would be difficult, leaving us tired and struggling for air. Physical activity would become extremely hard, and our memory and focus would suffer. So let's be grateful for the oxygen levels we have now. They're the perfect balance for us to thrive. In this exhilarating journey through an oxygen-rich world, we've experienced breathtaking wonders and discovered the delicate balance of our planet. Let's cherish the magic in every breath, respect the interplay of oxygen and life, and embrace the thrill of this remarkable ride called life. Whenever you hear about ancient ruins, you almost never picture them being suspended somewhere or just randomly hanging on the branch of a tree, right? In fact, for most of the ancient artifacts we have exposed in museums all over the world, archaeologists did quite an impressive amount of digging. You see, buildings have this funny way of fading away over time if not properly taken care of. Sometimes we need to reuse some building materials, so an older construction may be sacrificed in the process. Other times houses are abandoned, and once they are exposed to the elements on the surface, like rain or sunlight, they don't really stand a chance. Some just simply crumble away due to good old erosion. So the only way a piece of architecture can survive the test of time is if it's somehow gotten buried deep down. Now, how did they end up buried in the first place? Well, it's quite the comedy of errors. Ancient cities had a habit of gradually raising their ground level like a kid adding toppings to their ice cream sundae. You see, these settlements were always busy collecting food and building materials to keep up with their ever-growing population. But hey, who has time to deal with waste and rubbish? It wasn't exactly high on their to-do list back in the day. So when it came to building new houses, ancient civilizations found it much easier to save their sweat and tears by piling up the rubble and constructing right on top. But that's not all. Rivers would also occasionally flood and deposit a layer of sediment on the city floors, further encapsulating those ancient constructions. And in those dry regions like the desert, where the wind likes to show off its sand and dust dance moves, you can bet it was a constant struggle to keep the establishments clean. One hilarious example is the Sphinx, which had its head buried in sand until a group of archaeologists unearthed it in 1817. Some ancient towns eventually got covered up because they were completely abandoned. With less human activity to control their expansion, plant seeds couldn't resist the opportunity and sprouted all over the place. 
They gobbled up carbon dioxide from the air and grew, adding more and more bulk to the ground. Those cheeky roots even decided to stabilize the soil made from decaying plant matter, creating layers upon layers of earthy goodness. It's like the ultimate DIY project Mother Nature embarked on, with plants as her loyal helpers. The act of digging into the secrets of ancient civilizations is not just about unearthing a lost world. It's also an epic quest to reveal the hidden treasures beneath layers of history. But how do archaeologists know where to dig in the first place? If everything is covered in layers upon layers of sediments, debris, and plant roots, they must have some sort of system they rely on before embarking on a new project, right? For starters, they're not always the ones suggesting an archaeological dig in a certain location. Let me explain. Let's say you're a contractor and you want to build a new fancy apartment complex in your city. Some local legislations have certain requirements before your project can start though. For instance, before anyone starts building on a piece of land, they might need to bring in specialists to check the soil. These clever folks can be archaeologists, geologists, or paleontologists, and they need to keep an eye on things during development. If any artifacts or ecofacts, fancy word for organic remnants, are discovered, these experts swoop in to excavate and study them. But what about sites that have nothing to do with bulldozers and yellow hats? Archaeologists have more than one trick up their sleeves when it comes to locating ancient hotspots. They dive deep into historic records with a healthy dose of detective work. By sniffing out old documents and maps, they can piece together the puzzle of human activity in a specific area. If a site has been visited before, it's even better. Finding records of past excavations or historical accounts can give archaeologists lots of information on where to continue their treasure hunt. Before archaeologists start swinging their shovels, they engage in a bit of a visual scan mission. Armed with a grid system, they'll stroll around the site, keeping their eyes peeled for any artifacts that might be hiding just beneath the Earth's upper layer. From ground stone tools to historic glass and even ancient garbage dumps, yes, they're also valuable. These keen-eyed explorers can spot signs of human activity faster than most people. If they stumble upon midden soil, fancy term for a garbage dump, they know for sure that humans once called this place home. Archaeologists don't just rely on their trusty shovels, though. They have an arsenal of gadgets to aid in their search for hidden wonders. Geophysical tools are like their secret weapons. Take the resistivity meter, for example. This clever contraption measures the electrical component of the soil and any buried features or artifacts. A buried wall, for instance, will create a different resistivity reading than the surrounding soil. Magnetometers and ground-penetrating radar work in similar ways, showcasing potential hints of ancient treasures in the soil. And who could forget our trusty old friend, the GPS? It helps archaeologists map out precise locations, like a high-tech treasure map, leading them straight to their pot of gold. Care to virtually visit some of the most important archaeological sites in the world? Well, follow me. In the United Kingdom, for instance, you'll find this interesting place called Stonehenge. It's one of many henges scattered around, but this one really takes the cake. Picture this, massive ancient stones standing tall and proud, arranged in a funky outer ring and an inner horseshoe, with some smaller stones thrown in for good measure. And guess what? These amazing stones have been around for over 5,000 years. Talk about a serious case of rock-solid longevity. Now, here's where it gets interesting. According to local folklore, the legendary wizard Merlin whipped out his magic wand and poof! He teleported these massive stones all the way from Ireland. Apparently some giants had assembled them there, but Merlin decided they would look much better at their new location. Others think it's just the ruined remains of an old Roman spiritual edifice. These amazing structures were built by our Bronze Age ancestors. With their simple tools and limited tech, they managed to create this monumental masterpiece. Impressive, right? Unfortunately, there's still so much we don't know about this area. Stonehenge's initial purpose remains a mystery to this day. Sure, there are lots of theories, but scientists have yet to agree on the subject. However, we do know that it's perfectly aligned to catch the sunrise during the summer and winter solstices. The ancient city of Pompeii is an equally amazing archaeological site. Picture this. Mount Vesuvius a notorious troublemaker, decided to throw a volcanic tantrum and completely covered this ancient Roman city. It turned it into a time capsule, located outside present-day Naples in Italy. Fast forward to the year 1748, 
when a bunch of adventurous explorers stumbled upon Pompeii. Lo and behold, they discovered a treasure trove of well-preserved goodies, streets, houses, food, probably a bit stale by then, blingy jewelry, fancy sculptures, colorful frescoes, everyday household items, and even animal and human remains. It was like an epic archaeological party. From the looks of it, Pompeii had it all. Fancy houses and villas, a massive 20, 000 seat arena, cute little artisan shops, hangouts like taverns, and let's not forget the saucy spots like those luxurious bathhouses for some intense pampering. There's also the Sanctuary of Apollo, where people used to gather for their daily dose of worship. And of course, the bustling heart of the city, the Forum of Pompeii, where all the cool people used to hang out. And guess what? Pompeii is so cool that it made it to UNESCO's World Heritage List back in 1997. That's like the ultimate Hall of Fame for historical awesomeness. It also includes many other famous buildings and sites, like the Taj Mahal in India and the Acropolis of Athens in Greece. We people used to have real superpowers, but they all disappeared long ago because these abilities became useless and evolution took them away. For example, one of these superpowers was hibernation sleep. Yeah, it doesn't sound as cool as teleportation or flying, but in the modern world, it would be helpful. Imagine that you go to bed before winter and wake up in the spring. No cold weather, no spending money on food at this time, just a long, deep sleep. So perhaps our ancient hominin ancestors, more like primates than humans, could fall into a long hibernation. It was about 500,000 years ago, hundreds of thousands of years before the appearance of the first Homo sapiens. Hominini of that time lived in caves during the Ice Age and fell into a long sleep to survive. However, this is not a confirmed fact, but scientists have some guesses about it. Paleontologists discovered many fossils of our ancestors in one Spanish cave. The analysis showed that hominini lacked vitamin D and fat reserves. These strange indicators showed that the inhabitants of these caves could be in a state of hibernation. Perhaps their metabolic processes slowed down and their fat and vitamin reserves were depleted to support life during a long sleep. Of course, such an ability could be useful in the modern world, but it has several disadvantages. Let's look at the example of bears and what problems they can face during hibernation. Unique metabolic processes support their long sleep, but if these processes are violated, then after waking up, the bear can get very sick. This may happen because of an insufficient amount of fat and food reserves. Another ability from the past would help save thousands of dollars for modern people. This ability is strong and healthy teeth. Today, we have dental clinics, high-tech equipment, hundreds of types of toothbrushes and toothpaste, mouthwashes, and much more for the health of our teeth. Despite this, ancient people had stronger and healthier teeth. More powerful jaws and sharp teeth allowed them to chew on hard meat, and the immunity of the oral cavity didn't allow bacteria to develop. But then, agriculture appeared. People started to eat grains. This added new species of bacteria to the oral cavity, weakened the jaw muscles, and provoked cavities. Teeth became more fragile, but they got the most severe blow when people discovered sugar. Sweets added a lot of problems to teeth health. Previously, teeth worked as a tool for processing hard materials, but then we began to eat soft food, meatballs, and fried chicken, and the strength of teeth became meaningless. Evolution took that away from us. Our ancestors were taller, stronger, more agile, and more resilient than we are. A couple of days spent in the fields while hunting mammoths were the equivalent of a month of regular training in the gym. People were not obese. They ate natural food and looked like athletes. But why were they taller? What influenced bone growth? Over the past 10,000 years, the changes in growth were most noticeable. But this trend has changed in our direction in the last few centuries. People have started to get taller. 
It's difficult to determine the exact cause of such changes. It can be genetics, environment, lifestyle, nutrition, or modern technologies. So, 40,000 years ago, Cro-Magnons hunted and gathered in Europe. They were better developed physically, thanks to this lifestyle. Their ancestors migrated to Europe from Africa, which was the reason for the tall growth. Longer bones were helpful for adaptation to the hot African climate, but after 30,000 years, the growth of people sharply decreased because of the onset of cold weather and the development of agriculture. Our ancestors went through times of famine, and their bodies shrank over time to adapt to a meager diet. In addition, living next to livestock provoked the emergence of new diseases. All of it affected the appearance of ancient people. There are almost no such problems now. You can eat healthy food, receive medical care, and take vitamins. All this allowed us to grow a few inches taller. But one change in the human body still remains a mystery. We have the most advanced civilization in history today. People become professionals in neuroscience and thermonuclear physics, create powerful computers, have access to all the knowledge in the world, and study the boundless depths of space. But for some reason, our brains have become much smaller than those of people who lived several thousand years ago. But how is this possible, given that people were engaged in agriculture, trade, and the manufacture of simple tools in the distant past? Then big cities, architecture, art, and technology began to appear. And all this time, our brain was shrinking while humanity was moving forward. It lost a piece equal to four ping pong balls. The reason is not that people were more intelligent in the past. The volume of the brain is not related to intellectual level. It's possible that people's brains have shrunk because of collectivity. To understand what that means, let's take a look at ants. Scientists measured the brain size of some species. They saw that species participating in complex social systems had smaller brains. This means that if an ant interacts closely with other ants, sharing work with them, its brain decreases. Sharing duties with other species contributes to brain shrinkage. Its cognitive abilities are distributed among different groups performing different jobs. It seems like a brain unloads its working and thus becomes smaller. That is, if you live alone on an island, do agriculture, fish, and build a house alone, then your brain becomes bigger. But in a large society, where all these activities are distributed among many locals, the human brain is shrinking. In a sense, intelligence becomes collective. And at what point in time did human intelligence become as collective as possible? When writing appeared. It appeared about 2,000 years before the beginning of brain shrinkage. When people learned to write, they freed up a large memory area in the brain. They didn't have to keep all the necessary things and ideas in their minds. With the development of civilization, the collectivization of humankind grew. And then there was TV and the internet. We will discover how this affects our brains in the future. On the one hand, the volume may decrease even more. But on the other hand, we're surrounded by an endless stream of information. We don't know yet how it will affect the size of the brain. The collectivization of consciousness is only one of the hypotheses according to which our brain has increased. Another theory says that this happened because of the home lifestyle. The brain of a dog, cat, or other pet is smaller than their ancestors who lived in the wild without a human. When people started living in cities and spending less energy on getting food, their brains could also begin to shrink. In addition to the size of the brain, people have undergone many changes. Humanity now shows a huge variety in appearance, which the early Homo sapiens didn't have. In the distant past, they possessed the same physical properties characteristic of a particular region. For example, a short and stocky build was typical for people living in cold conditions. The body area of a small person helps to keep warm better. 
Also, the body area of a tall person gives off heat more efficiently, so people in warm African regions are taller. And in places where it's scorching during the day and frosts come at night, people can develop the ability to lower their body temperature without feeling cold and shivering. This phenomenon concerns the Australian native tribes living in the central desert. The environment affects external characteristics almost as well as genetics. And over the past 40,000 years, the speed of evolution has increased. The ability to travel and the growth of the people population contributed to the mixing of different ethnic groups across the planet, which also provided diversity in evolution. It seems like humanity still comes to the highest point of our evolution, and perhaps there are no limits to that.